Cerise's high-heeled boots clicked more heavily than usual. Against the marble tile of the Avalon View Luxury Apartments lobby, as she was weighed down by several bags of groceries. She wasn't accustomed to doing her own food shopping, but the service she normally used had recently been prioritizing clients who were either housebound or immunocompromised, leaving her high and dry. Ordering online proved hit or miss at best, and eventually, she accepted that if she wanted her groceries on time and to order, she would have to do it herself. Unfortunately, that didn't work out either. The long lines at both the entrance and the cashiers kept her well behind schedule, and the various supply shortages and rationing left her shopping list once again incomplete. And by the time she got back to her building, she was exhausted and frustrated, and sorely hoped that the earlier maintenance to the elevators had been finished so she wouldn't have to drag her meager yet hard-won haul up seven flights of stairs. Across the lobby, she spotted a single elevator with its doors open to a Golden Art Deco interior, a surprising upgrade from the faux wood paneling it had had before. Standing at its threshold was a smiling, handsome young man, dressed in a deep crimson uniform with gold accents. He looked like a doorman or a bellhop straight out of the 1920s. The only visible anachronism it being a face mask clipped to the brim of his cap. He waved her over with a hand clad in an immaculate white glove, assuring her that the elevator was fully operational. Evening, ma'am. Needing a lift? I'm James, and I'll be your lift attendant today. He greeted her cheerfully. Lift attendant? Charissa asked with a bemused smirk. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Chamberlain is employing us at all his properties now, James explained. We eliminate public contact with the controls and enforce physical distancing while adding a bit of old-fashioned class and personal service to the experience. If you'll kindly take your place in one of the marked corners, ma'am, I can have you upstairs in a jiffy. Cherie stepped into the elevator, noting with no small amount of delight that it was illuminated by a miniature chandelier. The three of its corners were each marked with unusually ornate silver decals, politely indicating where passengers should stand to maintain a safe distance from one another. Eighth floor, please, James, she instructed as she set her bags down on the floor around her. He took his place next to an elaborate brass control box, covered in switches and dials and indicator lights, with a large lever sitting on top. He flipped a few switches and turned a few knobs, and when he finally seemed satisfied, he pushed a button to close the doors. Going up, he announced, pushing the lever forward and initiating a smooth ascent. That's quite a contraption. Cherise commented, eyeing it with a hint of derision. What's it need to be so complicated for? It's a bit of a clutch, ma'am. Tech from different eras all cobbled together. But it gets the job done, James replied, while keeping his gaze focused intently on the readouts, the blinking indicator lights dimly illuminating his unblinking eyes. And here we are. Would you like some assistance carrying your bags to your suite? Nowhere in the elevator did it actually say they were on the eighth floor. But when the door slid open, the hallway looked as familiar as ever, so she decided to trust his judgment. Not tonight, James, thank you. Perhaps another time when I'm better prepared to receive company. She subtly smiled, and picking up her bags and heading into the hall. I look forward to seeing you around the building, young man. The feeling's mutual, ma'am. You have yourself a fantastic evening, he beamed, tipping his hat as the door slid shut. Cherise rounded the corner and set the bags down again by what she thought was her door as she inserted her keys into the lock, only for the door to stubbornly refuse to open. She frowned, pulling out the key to make sure it was the correct one. When she saw that it was, she tried again, 
only for the door to remain locked. Had James dropped her off on the wrong floor after all? Her first thought was to check the room number, only to see that the small bronze placard beneath her peephole was completely blank. She furrowed her brow in confusion, and turning her head to check the door across the hall. It too bore a completely blank placard. It didn't make any sense. She wondered if it was some sort of maintenance error or perhaps some petty spree of vandalism. But if her apartment key wouldn't work, that meant she was either on the wrong floor or that the superintendent had changed the lock. Groaning in frustration and with burdensome bags of groceries still in tow, she spun around to head back to the elevators in the hopes of finding out what floor she was on. When she turned the corner, she came to a dead stop, her frustration quickly morphing into fear at the impossible sight before her. Where the elevator lobby should have been, there was instead another hallway, a perfect duplicate of the hallway she had just come from, and a hallway that by all logic shouldn't have existed. Even if she was on the wrong floor, the hall would have to be stretching out onto Paladin Street, and elevators couldn't just disappear. Setting her groceries down on the ground, she sprinted off down the hall to see what was on the other end. Hello, is anyone here? I, I think I'm lost, she shouted as she ran, knocking on doors as she went. Not only did she receive no response, but every room she went by was deathly quiet. She could hear no voices or electronic media or humming appliances in any of them, as if they were all completely vacant. When she reached the intersection at the end, what she found was another identical hallway, with the same number of apartments, with no address numbers on their doors. At the end of that was another hallway, and another, and another, and then she realized she hadn't yet returned to her groceries. The halls all joined at 90 degree angles, so logically there could only be four. But logically the dimensions and location of the building wouldn't permit such a layout in the first place. She immediately began to backtrack, and sure enough, once she had gone back five halls, she found her groceries sitting exactly where she left them. She reached into her purse to grab her phone, only to find that it had no Wi-Fi and no network connection. She dialed 911 again and again, but never got a signal. As the dread in her stomach slowly grew, she felt a sudden spell of vertigo start to set in. She chose to sit down before she fell down. Breathing deeply, she forced herself to focus on analyzing the situation at hand. Somehow, she had stumbled into a series of hallways with no windows or exits, no connection to the outside world, and whose physical dimensions didn't appear to conform to her understanding of reality. It seemed surreal, and yet she was certain that she wasn't dreaming. If nothing else, the fact the groceries remained where she had placed them proved this place obeyed some kind of internal consistency. She did her best to stay calm, reminding herself that she had supplies and thus plenty of time to figure something out. Standing up and taking a sharpie out of her purse, she marked an X on the wall just above where she had set her groceries. And taking off her heels and picking up a bag of groceries to take with her, she set off to map the whole system, numbering each intersection and pointing her way back to her base. After an hour, she had numbered her 100th hallway. In each hall, she would shout out at least once, and try at least one random door to see if it opened. No one ever answered, and no door ever budged. No matter how far she went, she never came back upon any of the markings she had left, assuring her that in spite of their immaculate monotony, each hallway was unique. Each hallway was unique, yet identical, unless she did something to change it and devoid of anything that could be of any potential use to her. 
This was disheartening, as she had hoped to come across a fire extinguisher or any other blunt, heavy object that she might use to button the doors or walls with. She was considering accessing water through one of the pipes in the wall, but so far, the labyrinth had given no sign that it even held running water. In the full hours she had been wandering the hallways, she'd heard no noise other than those she'd made herself. No pipes, no air vents, nothing. The silence was starting to get to her. She couldn't remember being anywhere that was so still for so long. It was horrid enough being lost in an impossibly distorted version of her own apartment building, but feeling like she was the only living thing in such a seemingly vast space was unnerving to say the least. Accepting that she wouldn't find anything no matter how far she trekked on for, she relieved herself on the carpet and then headed back for her base camp. When she got back to the apartment which she had first mistaken as her own, she took a large can of tomato sauce from her groceries and tried to knock the door handle off with it. The can dented and deformed and eventually broke open, spilling all over her hands and the floor, but the door handle didn't show so much as a scuff. Whatever this place was, it seemed its matter was every bit as unearthly as its space was. Seemingly infinite and indestructible, there was no conceivable means of escape. Cleaning off her hands as best she could with the materials she had, she moved her base camp down far enough so that she couldn't smell the tomato sauce. Even though she could still smell it on herself, and did her best to sleep on the floor. As she struggled to fall asleep, she gave some thought to what could actually be happening to her. It all seemed real, even if it was impossible, and dreams were usually far less coherent and consistent than this place was. But if it was real, that meant that she wasn't anywhere in her reality. The phrase non-Euclidean geometry popped into her head, as a technically inaccurate descriptor for spaces that didn't conform to known geometric models. At first, she didn't understand how she could just waltz into a non-Euclidean space, but quickly remembered the newly remodeled elevator, its peculiar control box, and James. She had completely forgotten about that until now, the strangeness and desperation of her situation having been quite a distraction. But now that she thought about it, it couldn't have been a coincidence. It still sounded crazy, though. Someone converting her apartment building's elevator into some sort of space-bending contraption just to dump her into endlessly repeating halls? There seemed no point to it at all. Eventually, she did fall asleep, and when she awoke, nothing had changed. Her phone was her only means of knowing any time had passed at all. She morbidly wondered if she could conserve the battery long enough for her to die of thirst. After eating some of her perishable groceries, she set off to explore in the opposite direction as she had the following day. Again, she numbered each hallway. 100, 200, 300, 4. Somewhere around 500, the combination of exhaustion, hopelessness, and lack of sensory stimulation and took their toll and she broke out into a frenzy of screaming and banging on the doors as she ran through the halls, eventually collapsing into a sobbing mess. She stayed like that for a while, unsure of what else to do, until the unbearable silence was finally broken by the sound of faint music. Perking her head up, she had to strain to hear it, but it was there. It sounded like it was coming through a door around the corner. Hey, hey, she shouted, leaping to her feet and breaking into a desperate sprint. As she drew closer, she could recognize the music of Frank Sinatra singing That's Life on Vinyl. When she rounded the corner, it was apparent the music was coming from the door at the end of the hall. She ran towards it with such fervor she nearly crashed into it. Unlike all the other thousands of doors she had walked past over the last few hours, this door had a number on its placard, room 101 to be exact. 
It was further differentiated by a shiny brass door knocker with the Darlings engraved upon it. Hello? Hello? Is anyone in there? I, I, I need help. Cherise pleaded as she banged with the knocker with her right hand and pounded on the door with her left. The music kept playing, but the feeling of hope was kindled within her at the sound of someone getting up from a chair and walking towards the door. She heard a deadbolt click, and then the door opened as far as a chain lock would allow for. Through the slightly ajar door, Cherie saw a young woman with onyx black hair and baby blue eyes. She was wearing a vintage 1950s dress and had her hair in curled pigtails, which at any other time, Cherise would surely have found at least a little strange, but now she was just overwhelmed with relief at having found another human being. Oh, what's going on out here? The young woman asked, her tone one of timid confusion. Oh my god, thank you so much, Cherise sobbed her voice cracking as she did so. I have been trapped in these hallways since last night. They've just been going on forever and none of the doors will open and you're the only other person I've found since I got here. Okay, the young woman said, her voice filled with uncertainty. I'm going to let you in so that you can calm down and we'll try to work out what's going on, all right? Yes, whatever you want. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Cherise agreed eagerly. The woman obviously didn't believe her story, which was fine with her. At the moment, she was no longer sure she hadn't just had some kind of psychotic breakdown. The door closed just enough for the woman to unlock it, and then opened fully. I'm Mary, by the way. She introduced herself as she led Cherise to the sofa. Cherise... She answered as she sat down. All right, Cherise, I'm just going to make a phone call and then I'll get you some tea and we can talk. How does that sound? Mary smiled. Lovely, thank you. Cherise nodded. Mary walked across the room and Cherise heard the unmistakable sound of a rotary phone being dialed. She was surprised that someone who looked to be right in the gray zone between Millennial and Zoomer would even know how to operate such a device, let alone own one. When she combined that oddity with Mary's dress, the decor of the room, and Frank Sinatra still singing away on what was obviously a genuine 1950s record player, panic began to rise again in Cherise's mind as an odd thought came to her. A crazy thought, but no crazier than being trapped in an endlessly repeating set of halls. She began frantically looking around the room for anything modern or something with a date on it. She spied a 1950s-style pinup calendar on the back of the door, which, to her great relief, clearly said 2020 right next to the month. She sighed at the realization that this girl was just very dedicated to her decorating theme. For extra confirmation, she pulled out her phone to see if she could finally get a signal. And sure enough, there was a notification alerting her to the fact that the password encrypted Wi-Fi was available. There was still no cell signal, however, and that was definitely strange. She couldn't remember ever not having any reception in the building before. She glanced towards the open balcony doors to check on the weather for some possible explanation, which is when another unsettling realization struck her. The room number had been 101. And yet clearly, they weren't on the ground floor. Hello, darling. Uh, yes, of course it's Mary. How many other girls have this phone number? Uh-huh. Did she now? And Mary spoke into the phone receiver, and cheerfully at first, but her voice taking on a noticeable edge as her eyes darted up towards Cherise. Her name wouldn't have happened to be Cherise by any chance, now would it? Because she's here right now, darling. I found her pounding at our front door, scared out of her wits, and reeking of urine and tomato sauce of all things. What on earth did you do to her? Wrong floor. That's all you have to say? When Mary turned her back, Cherise rose from her seat and crept over to the balcony in the hopes of finding a fire escape. 
she was too scared to try the halls again, but it was becoming clear that not all was right with Mary's apartment either. When she looked out over the balcony, all she saw was a kaleidoscope effect of blue sky, white clouds, and myriad reflections of herself, all staring out with the same shock and horrified expression on their faces. Sorry about the sky, Ducky. Maybe you should have come when I was better prepared to receive company, Mary said vehemently as she angrily stirred some sugar into her tea. Cherise turned around slowly, staring at the insidiously benign-looking woman across from her in confounded terror, unsure even how to react. What is this place? She managed at last. Room 101, she replied nonchalantly, casually sipping her tea. You're reasonably well-read, aren't you, Ducky? You know it's in room 101, right? Mary smirked as Sharice bolted for the door, desperate for the hall she had longed to escape only moments ago. To Sharice's surprise, the door actually opened, except now the once grand hallway looked to be suffering from a century's worth of neglect and decay. Covered in cobwebs and lit only by flickering lights that threatened to give out at any moment. This hallway also went on forever, with no turns or end in sight. As she ran, she could hear the doors creak open as she passed, but she didn't dare to look back to see what was emerging from those once inaccessible rooms. Over the pounding of her own heart and footfalls, she barely noticed that Frank Sinatra was still crooning away as loudly as ever. She screamed as she felt the ragged carpet being pulled out from under her, throwing her to the ground. She spun around to see Mary dragging the carpet towards her, an enormous meat cleaver clenched in her psychotically grinning mouth, and an assortment of other suddenly terrifying kitchen knives held in the sash of her dress. Cherise rolled off the carpet and into the adjacent room, slamming the door shut and bolting the lock. It splintered and shook as Mary appeared to be using her meat cleaver as an axe to break through it. Cherise Crab walked away from it as she sobbed, desperately looking around for anything that she could use to fend off her attacker. She shrieked when she realized she was right in front of a rotting skeleton slumped against the wall, a handgun pointed at its chin, and a large exit wound at the top of its skull. She grabbed the gun with so much force that the corpse's hands disintegrated into tiny phalanges and metacarpals. With a trembling grip, she pointed the gun at the door, not knowing if it was loaded or would still fire even if it was. Mary thwacked and thwacked and thwacked until the door burst into shards. Cherise pulled the trigger and the gun successfully fired. She fired again and again, getting off a total of eight rounds before the gun began clicking impotently. Shaking, her ears ringing and her vision clouded with gun smoke, she slowly lowered the gun to assess the damage. She expected to see the bullet-ridden corpse of her enemy lying in the hallway, but found no sign of Mary. She took a few tentative steps out into the hall, looking each way, only to find it deserted, but did notice a few splotches of blood leading away from her. Mary was still well enough to retreat, it seemed, but she was injured, and that at least bought Cherie some time. She turned around to search the apartment for anything else that might be of use and saw a smiling and unharmed Mary blocking her way. Boo! She shouted as she brought the meat cleaver down on her skull. <sighs> Mary, darling, could you come here a moment, please? James asked, a hint of displeasure in his voice. Yes, James, darling, Mary asked appearing from behind him the instant she was summoned, her hands innocently folded behind her back. Would you kindly explain this? James requested, gesturing to Charisse's mutilated corpse sprawled out on the lobby floor. The meat cleaver to the head hadn't quite done her in, and it looked like Mary had taken her time finishing her off. Oh, right. Mary hung her head in shame. Uh, I'm sorry, darling. I know I should have waited for you. Then why didn't you? 
The rule is that when one of us lures a new plaything back home, we let them wander until we're both here and decide on what to do with them. Jane reminded her sternly. But, but she started to break before you got back, and it's no fun playing with broken toys. Mary explained. So, I let her into the safe room, just to see if I could fix her up a bit before you got home. But I didn't know how much longer you'd be, so I thought I'd better call you and tell you to hurry back. And... And that's when you said she had been flirting with you. Uh, I said she might have been flirting with me, and I was mostly teasing. James said with a shake of his head. You can't tease me about that. You know how jealous I get. Mary said with gritted teeth. Fine, fine, mea culpa. And did you at least make it sporting? Of course, darling. I brought a knife to a gunfight. How much more sporting could I have made it? Just the one knife? That doesn't sound like you at all. James smirked and then frowned as he considered the implications. And was it just her you killed? What about all the other playthings I picked up in the elevator? Well, you know how I get. Blood in the water and all that. She replied, hanging her head and kicking her shoes. So there are none left for me? James asked as he threw his hands up in exasperation. Mary darling, if I didn't know any better... Sometimes I'd swear you were a complete sociopath. Nash paused for a moment and to look up from the unlit, pothole-ridden street to the crumbling shell of an office building towering over him, just to make sure he'd really seen it. And there it was, a flicker of white and gray light from a window on the fifth floor, unmistakably recognizable as the comforting, familiar, and wholesome glow from a television. That building had been one of the first to shut down when it became undeniable that his Rust Belt City's heyday was behind them. It hadn't had electricity since before Nash was born. Even if someone was just squatting or doing drugs up there, they wouldn't have brought up a whole television and power supply with them. Would they? Nash glanced around to see if there was anyone else to see what he was seeing, but the street was deserted. He looked back up at that strobing, mesmerizing light, the only light on the entire building, and seemingly the only light within view at all. It was like a campfire burning on top of the highest point in all the realm, broadcasting its location to everyone for miles around. Not a smart thing to do, considering what a very unenchanting realm it was. Smart or not, something was making and powering that light. Possibly something worth pawning. It was possible, or probable even, that the people who put it up were still around, and not at all unlikely that they might be dangerous. But Nash wasn't exactly a pushover either, and it was also just possible enough that the people watching that television were too starved or strung out to put up much of a fight. Reaching into his hoodie's pocket and concealing his butterfly knife in his palm, Nash moved in to investigate. The building's front door was unlocked, and in fact, it didn't seem capable of closing properly to begin with. Nash didn't risk giving away his own position with his phone light and made his way using only what meager starlight managed to slip through the filthy windows. As difficult as it was to move quietly through a near pitch black building that he'd never been in before, he somehow pulled it off. He made his way to the nearest staircase and climbed up to the fifth floor. From there, it wasn't hard to find his quarry. The hallway he found himself in was illuminated by the same white and gray flashing light that he had seen from below only far brighter. It poured out of an open doorway less than halfway down the hall from where he was standing. He listened cautiously for a moment before approaching, but heard no sign of human life. Hugging close to the wall, and creeping as silently as he was able, he made his way towards the beckoning light. 
he very slowly peeked his head into the doorway and saw a room completely devoid of human occupants. It was completely devoid of anything, actually, other than the television. It was a beauty, though. An old-fashioned box set that looked like it was from the 50s, though its apparent name of Inglorious Retrovision indicated it may have been a recreation. It had a dark wooden exterior with a convex screen on top, speakers on the bottom, and a pair of dial controls in the middle. It even had a pair of rabbit ears for picking up extinct analog television signals. It even had a pair of rabbit ears for picking up extinct analog television signals. The screen was on, displaying nothing but static snow. This was perplexing, however, since the television didn't appear to be plugged into anything. What in the hell? Nash murmured as he stood over the antique device, staring down at it in befuddlement. Without warning, the snow flickered for a few seconds before displaying a black and white title card, accompanied by the speakers playing dramatic music. Nash took a step back in surprise before actually reading the screen. Underage serial killers in my neighborhood? It's more likely than you think. A public service announcement from the Yofian Occult Order. Nash only had time to read it once before the title card was replaced with the black and white image of a young man standing on a picturesque suburban street. He looked to be about 20 years old with lean, feline features and slicked back black hair. He wore a dark suit and held a lit cigarette in his hand. Mothers and fathers, I'd like to speak with the little ones for a moment if I may, the man said in a soft tone. Below him flashed the words, James Darling, Master Adderman, Planeswalker, Confirmed Demi Eldridge, but don't tell anybody. Hey there, sport, sporthead. If you're anything like me when I was a boy, you probably can't wait to go out into the world and do your civic duty by depopulating it of a few undesirables. It's a fine thing to be sure, not to mention fun, but if you're young and unprepared, it can also be very risky, but you don't have to take my word for it. What the fuck is this shit? Nash asked with a bemused smirk, sitting down in front of the old television to watch the surreal show. The scene cut to an image of a young woman, the same age as the man, with the same feline features and dark hair, worn in pigtails, as if trying to project an air of innocence. She was in a 1950s dress, matching the overall feel of the show. Though her face was less somber than the man's had been, she seemed elated, actually. Almost expectantly so. Mary darling, do you remember why you started killing at such a young age? The man's voice asked from off screen. Of course, James darling. It made me feel powerful. She answered chipperly. She held out a cigarette for him to light, to which he kindly obliged. As she took her first puff, the words, Mary Darling, Mistress Adderman, Plains Walker, confirmed Demi Eldritch, seriously, don't tell anybody, it's a secret, appeared at the bottom of the screen. It's not so easy being a little girl, you know. You feel so small, so helpless, so frightened, so dependent on those bigger than you, and yet always scared that the same size and strength you depend on might be used against you. I didn't like being scared. I wanted to be feared. I wanted to be the scariest thing walking on two legs so that I would never have to be afraid again. And how did you go about doing that, Mary Darling? The man asked. With knives, the woman smiled. The scene cut to what looked to be a prepubescent Mary, slowly pulling out an artisanal butcher's knife from a wooden block stuffed full of equally ostentatious knives, staring at it with an ear-to-ear -ear smile. You remember what a beautiful set of kitchen knives Mommy and Daddy had, don't you, James Darling? Of course I do, Mary Darling. So many beautiful knives, and you weren't allowed to touch them because you were a boy. But I had to learn how to cook. That's all Mommy ever used them for, though. 
making us food, but every time I held those knives, I felt safe. Every time I cut or sliced something with them, especially meat, and especially when it was juicy, I felt powerful. So long as I was holding one of those, all it would take was one well-timed, well-placed thrust to end someone's life, no matter how much bigger they were. I know you understand how emboldening holding even a small knife can be. She said this last sentence, staring directly at the camera. Nash glanced down at the butter knife still in his hand, unable to suppress the unsettling thought that she had been addressing him directly. But suppose they had a knife, the man proposed. What then? Knives only empower those willing to use them for that purpose. Mommy proved that, the woman replied, her cheerful expression fading out slightly, momentarily distracted by some bitter memory. But even if someone else did have a knife and was willing to use it, it wouldn't matter. And why is that? Because nobody, and I mean nobody, handles a knife like me, she grinned. I knew that if I had a knife with me at all times, I'd never need to be afraid. But Mommy would notice if one of her knives were missing, and she wouldn't have approved of me running around with them. So I had to get my own knife. The scene cut back to young Mary, this time gleefully looking over a glass display case of hunting and pocket knives, as happy as a kid in a candy store. You were with me, I think, when I bought my first knife. Oh, yes, you definitely were because I remember making you promise not to tell mommy or daddy that I had it. And, of course, you talked the salesman into selling it to me and keeping his mouth shut about it. You were always better with people than I was. It cost me two whole dollars, two whole months of allowance money that I saved up and paid for all in quarters, but it was worth it. It was such a beautiful folding knife, perfect for keeping secret. I kept that knife on me at all times. I even slept with it, and no one was ever the wiser. And how long before you took your first life with it? The man asked. The scene cut again to young Mary, this time repeatedly stabbing another young girl in the torso. Weeping and screaming, the girl begged for mercy as she impotently tried to fight back. Blood and bits of viscera soaked her dress and splattered onto a cackling Mary, whose eyes and smile beamed along with psychotic, manic delight at what she was doing. Whoa, whoa, what the fuck? Whoa, what the fuck is this? Nass shouted as he crawled backwards from the television and stumbled to his feet. That's it, I'm out of here. He turned around, colliding with the now closed office door. What the hell? He shouted again. He hadn't closed it, nor had he noticed if there had even been a door to close. He frantically turned the knob, but it was locked from the other side. He slammed the door with his shoulder once, twice, three times, but it wouldn't break. He spun around with the intention of picking up the television and throwing it through the door, but froze when he saw Mary staring at him from the other side of the screen with an annoyed expression. She and James had paused their interview, but the footage was undeniably still playing. We weren't done yet, she said, her tone firm and commanding. Sit down, Ducky, and let us finish. Nash swallowed nervously, but obeyed. He didn't know exactly what was going on, but he couldn't deny that Mary was addressing him directly and that he was in no position to refuse her demands. Mary smiled as she sat down and then turned back to her twin, you were saying, James, darling. How long was it before you used that knife to make your first kill? He asked, the same scene replaying as before. This time, Nash remaining still for its duration. Not long. That's why I got it, after all. I never started with animals, you know. I started with people straight away. Seeing people writhing in agony because of me, begging for their pathetic lives, helpless as I end them with the final thrust of my knife. It's orgasmic. She repositioned her head slightly, 
making sure she was looking Nash right in the eye. And addictive. I'm a binge killer and I've gone up to three months in between binges, but my binges are wild, let me tell you. I've killed thousands of people in my time for no other reason than I enjoy it and they can't stop me. And I'm sure that's the part that our audience is a little confused about right now. The man interjected. How can a little girl with a knife be so unstoppable? Mary smiled widely and blushed, demurely averting her eyes from the camera. It's because we had a secret playroom, you and I. When we wanted to, we could turn our closet door into a portal to get to it. We weren't just little kids in there. We were gods. It was a good place to hide stuff, too. Stuff like cigarettes or bodies. When the timing worked out, we'd lure people over to our house without anyone knowing, show them our playroom, and kill them there. We took who we could get, but we both liked killing girls the best. They just screamed better, and back in those days, especially tended not to fight back as much. And that's how it was for the first few years, but eventually the high rate of disappearance started attracting some undesirable attention that made us nervous. I didn't want to end up like Great Uncle Lawrence. Luckily, that's when you, clever boy, figured out how to change our playroom's portal to any door or hole we wanted and the world was our oyster. Okay, what? Nash asked, rubbing his eyes at the retrovision seemed to be putting an unusual amount of strain on. I thought I walked in on some sort of snuff film, but now you're babbling about portals and pocket dimensions? I don't get it. Well, what do you people want with me? It seems we have our first audience question, Mary Darling, James said. How would you like to answer it? Mary again made direct eye contact with Nash, a wickedly eager grin spreading across her face. With a demonstration, she beamed. Without warning, she lunged forward, passing through the screen like it wasn't there. She grabbed Nash by the wrist, and before he could offer even a token display of resistance, she had pulled him through the screen and onto the other side. There was no color there on that side of the screen. All was black and white. But Nash was so confounded by what had just happened, he scarcely noticed. He took in his surroundings in a confused, frantic blur, trying to make sense of it. Above him, the entirety of the sky was overcast with the same static snow he had first seen on the retrovision screen, only now... The ever-shifting black and white dots formed the most unsettling and repugnant patterns if he gazed at them for any length of time. Around him was a neighborhood of identical houses with identical lawns and identical fences, either as a satire of the monotony of suburban planning or just a genuine lack of creativity on the part of its designers. Nash sincerely hoped it was the latter. Standing over him were the darlings, James and Mary, looking exactly as they had on screen, the cigarettes in their hands, and a predatory sparkle in their eyes. Stay back! Stay back! Nash screamed as he wildly waved his butterfly knife through the air. The twins exchanged smug glances with one another. Do you want to take this one, James, darling? Mary asked politely. I did make a bit of a pig out of myself on our last hunt. Already forgiven, Mary darling, James assured her. And besides, you've been the star of this little documentary of ours so far. It would be a terrible creative decision to shift focus now. Mary smiled, sharply turning her head towards Nash, her gaze steely and shark-like. You call that a knife? She asked quietly. This is a knife? She pulled out a ten-inch butcher's knife, with a clipped point from the sash of her dress. With well-honed aim, she threw it, impaling the palm of Nash's right hand with it. Dropping his own blade, he screamed in agony, clutching his injured appendage as close to his chest as he could without impaling himself further. You're welcome, Mary said. She held out her right hand, and the fallen butterfly knife flew into it, as if her possession of the blade 
was an inviolable law of physics in her world. Remember what I said about knives only empowering those who are willing to use them for that purpose? You've got a knife now, a proper knife, so if you can't use it to protect yourself, that's your own fault. You fucking psycho bitch! Nash wailed, crimson blood dripping onto the mono-colored ground below him. And Mary took a deep inhalation, savoring the scent of it. So beautiful, it too beautiful not to show in all its glorious technicolor, she mused. You've got two options here, Rambo. Fight or flight. If you pick flight, I'll give you a head start of 30 Mississippis, starting now. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi. With a sharp cry, Nash pulled the butcher's knife free from his hand, letting it fall to the ground as he tried to stem the flow of blood. Mary was still counting, her voice taking on a notable tone of irritation at Nash's casual disregard for such a lovely knife. He wanted to punch her, to beat her into a bloody stain on the pavement. He really did. But some primal instinct told him that Mary was not a wholly human and that his best chance for survival was to run and hide. So he did, leaving the only weapon he had behind. Mary stopped counting, and she and her brother glared down at the abandoned knife with disdain. Very poor tactical decision on his part, James said with a shake of his head. That's going to cost him. Severely, Mary growled, breaking into a sprint and snatching up the knife as she chased after her prey. As Nash ran, he dripped the trail of blood behind him. Its brilliant, vibrant redness amidst the otherwise grayscale world creating an all-too-obvious path for his tormentor to follow. He didn't bother trying to break into any of the houses. Even if they weren't locked, Mary would just follow the blood and he'd be trapped. So, he just ran. He didn't know what else to do. He kept his head pointed forward, not daring to look up at the abominable sky. When he heard the sound of Mary's feet pounding against the pavement as she chased after him, he didn't look back. His eyes glanced side to side just enough to see that the houses he ran past weren't vacant. Forlorn, a barely discernible silhouette stood in the windows, observing the outside spectacle with a fatalistic but morbid curiosity. When he dared to stare at them for more than an instant, he saw that they were made from the same television static as the sky. That was when the front doors creaked open, and the static started pouring out of them like an English fog. It obscured everything around him, growing thicker and thicker by the second. He could feel it as a tingling on his skin, and hear it as a buzzing in his ears. Worst of all, there was no avoiding the patterns now. The patterns in the snow formed a mutating Rorschach test of impossible, alien shapes before his eyes, and incomprehensible whispering in his ears. They weren't threatening in the way that Mary was threatening, but through the mere act of being, they implied an existential horror far greater than being slaughtered like a lamb. The static itself soon overwhelmed his senses, blinding and deafening and numbing him to all else. The dread sapped his limbs of their strength, sickened him so horribly that he began to vomit. He didn't even know if he was still running anymore or if he had fallen to the ground, but he did have a vague awareness that he was weeping and screaming and desperately trying to block out the static. He was only snapped back to reality by the sensation of Mary's butcher knife carving into him. Technical Difficulties Please stand by. Well, boys and girls, I hope you all learned something today. Sure, hunting your fellow man for sport can be a hoot, but it can also be downright dangerous. Mary and I were fortunate to have a secure killing ground and larder, but many of you probably aren't so lucky. And I certainly hope none of you are lucky enough to have a pet Vagathos to fall back on if you find yourself in a tight spot. Remember, if your quarry gets away or someone finds their bodies, you'll get caught 
and then it's game over, bucko. It's best to wait until you're old enough to be licensed and registered, 18 to 21 depending on your jurisdiction, so that you can kill safely and sustainably. I know that may seem like a long time, but with a little patience, one day you'll be able to kill with the same skill, gratification, and impunity as Mary here. Mary lay naked upon the ground. At some point in her frenzy, having discarded her dress and taken the opportunity to bathe in Nash's blood, nearly every inch of her was crimson now, her body the only patch of color amidst the gray that surrounded her. Her chest rose and fell as she panted heavily, her belly gorged with her favorite cuts of meat. The shredded remains of Nash's body were strewn about her in a haphazard manner. Mary having done to his flesh, what the thing in the static, the Vogathost, had done to his mind. She slowly raised the knife to her mouth and licked it clean, ruby rivulets dripping down her tongue as she savored every last instant of her kill. Stay sanguine, America. Good night. James knelt down to his sister and extended a sweet martini garnished with a maraschino cherry. Thank you, James, darling, she said as she accepted the refreshment. Mm, sorry about the mess. Should we clean it up before the next take? Let's leave it in. An Easter egg for the more eagle-eyed viewers, like the munchkin hanging himself in the Wizard of Oz. James smirked as he sipped an old-fashioned cocktail. Oh, Looks like the Retrovision's got another bite. Is our leading lady ready for an encore? Can I do the whole interview like this, but just act like it's completely normal? She asked excitedly. Naked and covered in blood? She pulled the cherry off its skewer with her teeth. It'll freak them out so much. A slow and sadistic grin spread across James's face. His naked... Blood-splattered sister on the black-and-white retrovision was the most salacious idea they'd had in a while. I think a little splash of color is exactly what this production needs. The man found himself in complete darkness, but that's not what concerned him. He wasn't alone in the darkness either, but that was also of no concern to him. The others were captives, like himself, presumably bound with silk cords to a bolted-down chair, like he was. He had heard two other muffled voices so far, a man and a woman, screaming and cursing and threatening and weeping, demanding to know what was going on until their voices were hoarse. He had so far not made a single peep to alert his fellow captives of his presence, or his captors of his wakefulness, and he was beginning to wonder if that was the problem. His captors knew he was awake, though. He had no doubt of that, but perhaps they wanted to see all of their prisoners squirm in their seats for a bit before they would reveal themselves. Or worse, his silent stoicism was making them suspicious Live from Inglorious Retrovision Studios, just outside the space-time nexus of Follywood, California, it's time for Fun and Fatalities. The man's train of thought was violently interrupted by an upbeat, though horrendously distorted, instrumental theme song playing on overhead speakers. Multiple colored spotlights raced around the studio. A conglomeration of nine monitoring screens began flickering static, before displaying the show's title in black and white, and a large, vertical game wheel flash with red and black strobe lights as it lazily spun about. And now, let's all give a big hand for our host, the atrocious, the malicious, and the disgracefully depraved James and Mary Darling, the announcer cheered. The spotlights turned white and settled on the stage, where a pair of smiling young adults walked arm in arm to the podium waving jovially to the audience. Both had dark black hair and bright blue eyes, and looked so much alike they were undoubtedly siblings. 
James had his short hair slicked back and wore a black suit and bow tie, and Mary wore her hair long and coiffed, along with bright red lipstick and a glittering red sequin dress with matching heels. And together they looked formal and presentable, almost old fashionably so, and had they not first kidnapped their guests and bound them to their seats, there would have been nothing bad to tip them off that they were in for a very, very bad time. The first two captives were understandably baffled by the revelation that they were on a game show, but the last contestant, though he had not been expecting it specifically, wasn't surprised in the least. Good evening, everybody, and thank you all so much for joining us tonight, both here and at home. It just means the world to both of us. It really does. Jane spoke into the microphone as the music died down. For any new viewers, as well as our lucky guests who didn't know they were going to be here tonight, I'm your host, James Darling. And this magnificent creature next to me is my sister and co-host, Mary Darling. Mary blew a kiss towards the audience, and canned cheers and catcalls began playing over the speakers. The actual audience, the vaguely humanoid silhouettes filling the dimly lit bleachers, didn't make a sound. They barely moved. But there was just enough shuffling and jostling and rocking to and fro to make it clear that they weren't dummies or cardboard cutouts. Something was in the audience, watching the show. We have an amazing show planned out for tonight, don't we, James Darling? Mary asked rhetorically, her smile turning nefarious as she leered hungrily at the three unwilling contestants in front of her. Oh, you bet we do, Mary Darling, James agreed with an eager nod. Why don't you walk our contestants and viewers through how the game works before we get started? Gladly, darling, Mary said as she strutted over to the game wheel. It couldn't be easier. My brother picks a victim, then I... Contestant Mary. James corrected her with an exaggerated finger wag as canned laughter filled the air. Oops, sorry. My brother picks a... Contestant? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And then I spin the wheel, Mary explained. It lands on a challenge, and if a contestant survives a challenge, they move on to the next round. Each challenge can only be used once per game, and the game goes on until either there are no more contestants, a final contestant survives the last challenge, or all the challenges are used up with multiple survivors left, who must then face off in a battle royale until there's a champion. Well, as fun as that might be, I really don't think any of today's contestants have it in them to make it through until the end of the game, James lamented, cueing moans of disappointment from the speakers. Mary, darling, why don't you just show them what sort of prizes they can win so that they all have a little extra motivation to give it their all? Today's champion will be walking away with their very own inglorious retrovision television set, Mary announced as she gestured dramatically to a rising curtain revealing several distinct 1950s-style televisions sitting on podiums, all of them displaying harshly buzzing static. Each television set is a unique custom build by the master mechanist, Vladia Dragovich himself, capable of picking up a wide variety of occult and paranormal transmissions while doubling as an Orwellian telescreen. You never know who's watching when you're watching an inglorious retrovision. With only a few hundred known to exist, and access restricted to the underworld market, each and every retrovision is priceless, making it a beautiful and valuable addition to any home. I'm not sure if I'd call them priceless, Mary Darling. If I recall, Dracovich sold them to us for a very reasonable price of one assassination apiece, James remarked. True, but I think our contestants value human life a little differently than we do, Mary smirked. Well, let's find out, shall we? Time to meet our first contestant, James said as his theme music started playing again. Grabbing the microphone in one hand and some cue cards in the other, he headed over to the female contestant, who was now trembling under the spotlight. Hello there, young lady. Welcome to the show. Let me tell you how this works. I'm going to take your gag off and you're going to play along. Or this is going to get much, much worse for you. Do you understand that? The woman looked up at James with terror-stricken eyes and saw that any facade of cordiality had vanished from his face. His expression was stern, 
uncompromising, and deadly serious. His eyes were utterly void of mercy, and she immediately lost all hope in begging for her life. She quickly glanced towards Mary and saw that she was staring at her with the same pitiless countenance. She looked back up at James and, with a fearful swallow, gave a broken and despondent nod. Fantastic! James beamed, the insincerely effervescent smile returning to his face. He pulled off her brightly colored gag and gently laid it over the back of the chair. What's your name, miss? P -p -p Petra? She stammered softly. And are you excited to be here, Petra? James asked, his smile growing from enthusiastic game show host to psychopath off his meds in an instant. E -e Extremely, James, she whispered. Outstanding. That's what I like to hear. You were paying attention a moment ago, weren't you? Mary spins the wheel, you do what it says, and if you survive, you move on to the next round. You got that? Petra nodded as enthusiastically as she could with gritted teeth and tear-stained cheeks. You heard her, Mary darling. Spin the wheel, James instructed. The pre-recorded audience repeated his request, while the actual audience remained as eerily silent as ever. Mary spun the enormous wheel as hard as she could, sending it revolving in a dizzying whirlwind of red and black lights. After several seconds, it slowed to a crawl, the pointer arrow passing over one torturous challenge after another until finally settling on Bloody Mary. Looks like our first challenge is Bloody Mary, James announced, to more canned cheering and applause, though his sister's excitement appeared to be genuine. Petra, Bloody Mary means that my sister gets to do whatever she wants with you. Do you think you can handle her? Based solely on her appearance, most people would probably assume that Mary's physical and behavioral capacity for violence was minimal. But given the circumstances, Petra wasn't willing to make any assumptions about anything. Do I have a choice? She asked. Not if you want to win that TV, James laughed. Or live, Mary added, impatience clearly creeping into her tone. Hear that, audience? Mary Darling doesn't like to be kept waiting, James said loudly, before bending over to whisper to Petra. Trust me, the angrier you make her, the more fun she'll have with you. What's it gonna be? Y yes, I, 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 yeah, I'll, I'll fight her or whatever, Petra nodded. That's the spirit. It's always better for ratings when the women go up against Mary. Gives the illusion of fairness, James remarked. Mary Darling, what are you going to do with our brave Petra here? I think I'm going to have to go with 21 Knife Salute, she answered, turning the wheel so that the arrow landed on her preferred challenge. 21 Knife Salute it is, James agreed, pulling out the vintage TV remote and pressing one of its many round and gleaming buttons. In an instant, Petra went from being restrained in her seat to being restrained to a human-sized game wheel. Mary stood exactly 21 feet away from her, which she knew because the floor between them had been delineated in one-foot increments. What? What? Petra gasped, unable to comprehend what had just happened. The magic of television, James explained nonchalantly. Now don't you fret, Petra. This is one of our easier challenges. What happens here is I spin you round and round, and Mary Darling throws a few knives at you. Twenty-one to be exact, James Darling, Mary added, as she held up a bejeweled ebony dagger for the audience to get a good look at. She'll throw them one at a time, starting at the one-foot marker, moving a foot backwards after each throw. All she has to do is miss once, and you'll win the challenge. Even if she lands all 21 shots, but none of them are fatal, you'll still be declared the winner. Are you ready, Petra? I... Wait, she, she starts at the, at the one-foot line? Petra asked in dismay. Of course, Ducky. A good game gets harder the further along you get, Mary said with a sickly sweet smile, now somehow standing only a foot away from her without having traversed the intervening distance. 
Give her a spin, James Darling. Spin, 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 jeered the pre-recorded chants of the audience. No, 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 wait, p -p 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 please, Petra pleaded, but with one strong push, James sent her spinning rapidly. She screamed as she felt the first knife pierce her flesh. As the audience chanted out, One! Mary hadn't needed to throw the knife at all, given how close she was. She could have just thrust the knife straight ahead, but instead, she had thrown it slightly to the side and impaled Petra's left wrist. Her right wrist was next, as the audience cried out, Two! Three! Four! Her ankles were impaled as well, and when her left forearm was pierced at the cry of five, it became obvious that Mary had impeccable aim and was targeting Petra's outermost extremities and was moving inwards in a clockwise spiral. The audience kept counting up, and soon a combination of the pain and vertigo had Petra retching. With each throw, Mary did indeed take a step back, but it didn't seem to affect her aim at all. Seventeen, the audience cried as a knife penetrated Petra's abdomen and skewered her left kidney. With four knives already in each limb, Mary was moving on to the torso. Eighteen was her right kidney, of course, and nineteen was her stomach. Twenty hit her just below the diaphragm, and she knew there could be no doubt where Mary would aim next. The blood from her wound splattered down into her face as she continued to spin around, and the pain in her limbs was starting to give way to a cold numbness. Mary seemed to be taking longer to make her final shot, and a drum roll sound effect played to add to the suspense. P -p please don't, P -p please don't. Petra wept, unable to muster the strength for any more substantial final words. Twenty-one, the audience cheered as Mary's final knife impaled Petra's heart, ending her life instantly. Mary bowed graciously to the audience as celebratory music played and colorful lights flashed, then casually walked over to the spinning corpse to retrieve her knives. Well, that's a pity, James said insincerely as he checked the body for a pulse. Darling, please, you don't know the meaning of the word. Mary smirked as she took a long, savory sniff with the blood-coated knife in her hand. She tossed it into the audience, and the mass of silhouettes finally showed some interest in something, lunging for it like it was a foul ball at a Major League Baseball game. A sizzling, static -y noise arose from the crowd like they were a horde of rattlesnakes, and the studio lights flickered for a moment as they absorbed their sacrifice. The second contestant's eyes went wide in confusion and terror at this bizarre behavior, but the last contestant had to suppress a look of joy before the darlings noticed. He had found what he'd come for. Well, folks, Mary Darling sure did give us one humdinger of a performance for the first round, didn't she? James asked as he took his place at the front of the stage. Let's give her a big hand, shall we? There was more canned applause, but this time... The sizzling static sound of the real audience could just barely be heard beneath it. It's just too bad our first contestant couldn't stick it out for another round, Mary said as she skipped back to the game wheel. Hopefully, our next contestant is made of sterner stuff. James sauntered over to the lucky contestant number two, a very large and muscular man who looked like he might indeed put up more of a fight than Petra did. And what's your name, sir? James asked as he took the gag out of his mouth. Ah, you sick son of a bitch. Let me out of this chair, you fucking coward. You think you're hot shit, torturing a helpless woman to death? Untie me, and we'll see how tough you are, you and your psycho bitch sister. With one hand, James lifted the chair up in the air, pulling it out by its steel bolts, then violently slammed it back down into the floor. The contestant both winded and stunned speechless by the superhuman display of strength, said nothing as James loomed over him with a look of barely restrained rage. Don't ever talk that way about my sister, he growled before turning back towards the stage. Mary, darling, spin the wheel. The game wheel, 
now missing both the Bloody Mary and 21 Knife Salute challenges, started to spin once more. Say, Mary darling, what happens if the wheel lands on an empty slot? James asked with a theatrical flourish towards the camera. Not to worry, James darling, it's rigged, Mary assured him, the canned laughter playing right on cue. It's a good thing you freaks have a laugh track. Otherwise, I'd have no idea this shit was supposed to be funny. The contestant wheezed sardonically as he caught his breath. With a deathly cold grimace, Mary immediately stopped the wheel. It landed on... Feed the pigs. Excellent choice, Mary darling, James agreed, pulling out the TV remote once again. With the press of a button... The man found himself free of his restraints, but now trapped in a stage pit of some kind. Behind the steel gate, there were three large, black, vicious-looking pigs, all of them squealing hungrily and fighting to get out. Mary, darling, would you mind explaining the pig pit to our viewers, please? James asked, he and Mary standing side by side as they peered down from the edge of the pit. Not at all, James, darling. Mary smiled eagerly. You and I have always accumulated bodies faster than we could eat them ourselves. And at first, all we did was let them pile up in this pit here. Boy, did that stink something awful. Selling our surplus human meat on the underworld market brought in some much-needed capital, but we still had a lot of corpses and body parts that weren't exactly retail quality, shall we say. That's when we first got our little piggy pals here. Pigs eat pretty much anything, including all our leftovers. I started breeding the ones that were most useful to us, and before I knew it, I had myself a breed of man-eating monster pigs. And you sure outdid yourself with them, Mary Darling. Just look at how eager they are to get our contestant here, James said, holding up the remote control so the man below him could clearly see it. Listen up, contestant who couldn't be bothered to tell me his name when asked and thus shall die nameless. When I press this button, the pigs will be released into the pit and they will try to eat you. Your only chance is to fight them off with your bare hands. It's not a good chance since each of them outweighs you and has been bred for ferocity, but it's the only chance you've got. Understood? Ah, fuck you, he screamed his eyes roving around the pit wildly for any possible means of escape or defense. James snarled at him and forcefully pushed down on the remote. A harsh buzzer sounded, the gate flew open, and the three squealing pigs charged into the pit, jostling with each other as they scrambled to be the first to play with their new chew toy. The man screamed and took a running jump towards the wall of the pit, hoping to build up enough momentum to run the wall and grab the edge. This didn't work, and by the time he hit the ground again, the pigs were upon him. The first pig chomped onto his ankle with its full bite force, crushing the bone underneath. He screamed and fell to the ground as he tried to kick his foot free, only to succeed by severing it from his leg. He watched in helpless horror as the pig joyfully munched away on his dismembered foot, followed by his blood gushing out onto the floor. With his remaining foot, he tried to kick the pig away, but a second pig jumped onto his chest, savagely crushing his ribs under its weight. He tried to scream, but his lungs had been perforated by his own broken ribs, and the mass of the pig on top of him wouldn't let his lungs expand anyway. He desperately tried to push the pig off of him, but before he could even get his left arm in position, the third pig sunk its teeth into his forearm. With one sharp tug, it pulled the arm out of its socket and started gnawing on it like a dog with a bone. The first pig, having already finished with the man's foot, decided it wanted something a little less bony instead and went straight for the groin. It took his testicles, penis, and a good chunk of the mound off in one bloody bite, then mashed his manhood to a pulp between its forceful molars. Intestines started pouring out through the gaping wound, and the pig helped itself to those next. By now, the man knew he was done for, and just hoped that the pig on top of him would go for the jugular and end it quickly, as any decent predator would. But Mary had bred and trained her pigs not to go for a quick kill, 
and instead, it bit off his nose with a good portion of his upper teeth. With the next bite, it tore off his entire mandible, and still he lived as all three pigs ate him alive. It wasn't until the third pig started gnawing into his left side and the one on top crushed through his skull to get at his brain that he finally lost consciousness, along with a challenge. The creatures outside looked from pig to man, and from man to pig, and from pig to man again, but already it was impossible to say which was which. James quoted pompously, as the man beneath him was reduced to an unrecognizable smear of gore and viscera. Huh, I don't think that quote's as profound when the reason you can't say which is which is because the man's been mutilated beyond all reason, Mary remarked chipperly. Fair enough, James agreed, putting on a big smile as he spun to face the cameras. Well, folks, it looks like our second contestant isn't moving on either, just as well. We can't have someone who uses such foul language polluting our airwaves. It's obscene. I'd like to think of this as a family show. Hmm, not sure I'd want to meet that family, James Darling, Mary mused as she resumed her position by the wheel. I don't know about you, but after those last two kills, I think I might be feeling sated enough that our third contestant could actually have a shot at winning. Did you hear that, contestant? Mary Darling is feeling sated which is as close to merciful as she and I can get, James said, as he walked over to the final contestant. He undid his gag, and surprisingly, he did not curse or cry, but instead remained as stoic as he had been for the entire ordeal. And what is your name, sir? The man didn't answer immediately, and just as James opened his mouth to threaten him, he was interrupted. You know... I was worried that I may have actually underestimated you, that you were actually just stringing me along and had some ace in the hole, but you really don't know who I am, do you? The man asked with a wry smile. James, Mary, and the live studio audience all cocked their heads at this remark. It was rare for any of their victims, regardless of the setting, to act so calm and collected and his comment legitimately put them off their guard. We've met before, have we? James asked curiously. Ah, just once. But I had thought I would have left an impression, he replied. It was at Chamberlain's Halloween party on Pendragon Hill. Surely you remember that, don't you? The man smiled wider now and dense black vapor began exuding from every orifice on his face. James immediately backed away, while Mary rushed to his side, for now they did indeed realize who they were dealing with. Is someone actually watching this pathetic snuff film of yours? The contestant asked, examining the unmanned cameras, that it all turned to focus on him. Ah, for those of you just joining us, my name is Emrys the Eternal. I'm the physical avatar of an extra-dimensional cosmic entity summoned here last year in a botched ritual and in my spare time, I enjoy collecting and studying rare occult artifacts, practicing dark magic, and rose gardening. The laugh track was triggered, but glitched and just repeated the same few seconds of audio over and over. Uh, Emrys? James murmured in disbelief. You uh, let me catch you on purpose? Oh, my dear darlings. How long have you been at this now? Emrys asked condescendingly as he effortlessly rose from his seat. The illusion of a mortal man fell away and they beheld the visage of pale, gaunt, bearded Emrys clad in furs and bound in silver chains, a triple Ouroboros tattoo upon his forehead. Oh, sixty years at least? Luring mortals in here and playing with them like cats with mice, all while remaining completely immune to the violence you so delight in? Pitiful. I think it's well past time that you pick on someone your own size. A very rare look of terror was plastered across Mary's face 
but James let out an arrogant laugh at the challenge. <laughs> oh, you want to fight us? In our playroom? James scoffed. You may have bested us at Chamberlain's mansion, but we're gods in here. Just then, enormous shards of obsidian erupted forth from the floor to impale Emrys as he was enveloped in a vortex of white-hot fire with massive electrical discharges arcing down from the studio lights for good measure. And perhaps unsurprisingly, the concoction of plasma and fire and volcanic glass violently exploded, destroying all the cameras that had huddled around it. The blast wave was powerful enough to send both darlings flying through the air and up against their own game wheel, where they were crucified by fragments of obsidian through their limbs. Through the haze and debris, Emrys strode towards them, unscathed and unperturbed by James's impotent attempt to destroy him. Unscathed and unperturbed by James's impotent attempt to destroy him. Yes, yes, and I'm God, no matter where I am, he pontificated as he spun the wheel around so that he was face to face with Mary. Fortunately for you, darling, I'm not a vengeful god, as a vengeful god likely wouldn't forgive someone who stabbed them as many times as you did. You do so love your knives, don't you? Bygones, though, darling, bygones. She winced as he ran his hand along her face, trying her best to force back tears. She hated being afraid, and had tried very hard for almost her entire life to be the scariest monster there was, so that there would be nothing that could scare her. I know, darling, Emma smirked, effortlessly reading her thoughts. But in the grand scheme of things, you're still as helpless as any of your victims. She felt her brother's blood drip down from above her, and with a deep sob, she let her tears fall. James, James, are, are you alive? She wailed. I am Mary Darling, he grunted, pained but surprisingly calm. The reason for this was that from his elevated position, he could see what their audience was doing. The audience was, in fact, their pet, a creature which resembled a cloud of television static. More accurately, though, it was the imaginary patterns within the static, a type of thought form that arose from the meaning people saw in chaos. As the audience members silently marched towards Emrys, they merged together until they were nothing but screaming faces in a flickering, shapeless mass, rising up towards the ceiling and ready to crash down upon him like a tsunami. Tell me, Emrys, why did you come here if not for vengeance? James asked, genuinely curious now and not sure if he'd have a chance to ask again later. Emrys looked up at him and gave him a knowing smile. Lunch, he replied simply, spinning around, he reached out his hand towards the monster, spectral black tendrils shooting out from his palm and penetrating deeply into the snowy cloud. The nebulous creature began to writhe and shriek in agony, its amorphous form shifting wildly but steadily getting smaller and smaller, eventually leaving nothing behind but a small mass resembling a soggy, balled-up newspaper. No, no, what, what, what did you, what did you do? Mary screamed. Emrys retracted his miasmic appendages and shivered slightly, his fumes flickering briefly like static before returning to their abysmal black. Oh, after our previous confrontation, I realized I wasn't going to be able to channel enough of my true form's power into this body to achieve my ambitions, he replied, gesturing to the chains that restricted his power. So... I decided that I would have to absorb some other entity's power to make do until I can break these bindings. I shopped around a bit and heard through the grapevine that you two have been keeping a Vagathost as a bloody pet, fattened up with over a half a century's worth of sacrifices. That's some pretty potent egregoric power, and I think I'll be able to put it to very good use. Emrys extended his hand, 
and levitated what was left of the darling's pet tulpa, and transmuting it into a static-filled portal. He snapped his fingers, turning the obsidian pinning the twins to the wheel into smoke, and they plummeted to the floor. Thanks so much for having me on. It was a pleasure. Really? He beamed at them as he picked up Petra's corpse and slung it over his shoulder. Neither of them dared to ask what he wanted it for. I don't suppose you'll be inviting me back on, though, eh? If you ever set foot in here again, I will bind your soul to your corpse on an atomic level so that you can feel yourself rotting for all eternity, James threatened as he coddled his distraught sister. With a sage nod, Emrys took his leave through the portal, only to insolently step right back across it and head straight for the prize display. Aw, you know what? I technically won this. I'm taking it, he said, as he hoisted up one of the retrovisions and carried it across the portal with him. This time, it snapped closed, leaving the darlings sitting alone in their ruined studio. Their own looping laugh track, mocking them in their humiliation. My Grandpa Chuck is a baby boomer, and without a doubt, the most quintessentially boomer thing my grandpa does is maintain a display room. It's basically a second living room, except instead of Ikea, it's filled with artisanal luxury European furnishings, which no one is allowed to lay a finger on. He's got china cabinets filled with multiple sets of china that have never once been used. All manner of collectibles decorate every surface, and the only time they've ever been moved since they've been in that room is when my grandpa cleans the place. There's even an antique piano, even though he couldn't play chopsticks if his life depended on it. It's just a whole room filled with the most expensive things my grandfather could afford, treated as sacred cows of consumerism, none of which he dares to get any practical use out of. It's not that weird, not for a boomer anyway, but what is weird is that he keeps a television in there too. No one's supposed to be in that room, and I always thought that putting a television in there would just encourage people to use it. It's not a big TV either, and as far as I know, the only thing that really makes TVs expensive is their size. I did ask my grandpa about it once, about why it deserved a place in his display room, and all he would say was, they don't make them like that anymore. Late last year, Grandpa got sick and was in the hospital for a little while, and asked if I could house sit for him. He was slowly dying of his sickness, and his number one concern was that his stuff was okay. Pure boomer energy there. Regardless of what I thought of his priorities, I agreed so that he wouldn't be worried and can focus on getting better. He wrote down a rather extensive list of rules for what to do and what not to do, some of which were exasperatingly neurotic, but not really out of the ordinary. That is, until it came to the television in the display room. Here's what he wrote for it. When cleaning the display room, do not touch the television set, except for any of the reasons listed below. Rule number two, if the cabinet doors are open, close them immediately. Rule three, when the television is off, do not look at your reflection on the screen. Rule four, don't sit too close to the television, on or off. Five, if the television is on, turn it off immediately and remember, that TV isn't real. Six, when it's on, be careful not to bring your hand close enough to feel static on the screen. 7. If it doesn't turn off, leave the house immediately and call me. Don't try to unplug it. 8. Never change the channel. 9. If you fail to follow these rules and there's an incident with the television, do not destroy it. He doesn't make them like that anymore. I honestly wasn't all that concerned by this. 
My grandpa knew I was curious about his mysterious old television set, and I figured he was just messing with me. I had been in his house lots of times before, and I had no reason to believe that the television was dangerous or supernatural in any way. I settled into my grandpa's house and went straight to work after attending to his lengthy list of instructions. It was mostly yard work, even though there was no garden, just a large crop of homogenous grass under the vigilant gaze of ceramic gnomes and plastic flamingos, all of which he was inordinately proud of. Any weed or wildflower that dared to rear its non-conforming head was living on borrowed time, and if any of his neighbor's creeping ivy got onto his side of the fence on my watch, there'd be hell to pay. Being busy and outdoors most of the day, it wasn't until I was eating my dinner that evening that I noticed it. The sound of electric static. I didn't notice it all at once. It was more of a gradual awareness that I was hearing a very faint white noise that I couldn't account for. I silenced every appliance or electronics that I could listen to for it, and I realized that it was television static. I followed the sound into the hallway, and in the gap between the display room's door and the floor, I could see the flickering light of a television set. I was momentarily unsettled by this revelation, since it was an old clunker of a TV that shouldn't have been able to turn itself on. I quickly dismissed the thought as irrational, though. My grandpa must have left it on before he went into the hospital, either by accident or on purpose just to mess with me and both the sound and the light had been too faint for me to notice before. Remembering his list of rules regarding that TV, and fully aware there might be some kind of prank waiting for me inside, I cautiously opened the door and stepped into the cherished room of expensive and useless junk. It was as immaculate as I remembered it, seemingly not a single item having been moved since the first time I was there. The entire room was bathed in nothing but the monochromatic flickering from the staticky television, which made everything seem about ten times creepier than it did in the light of day. The only lamp in the room wasn't plugged into the correct socket for the light switch to work, so I didn't bother trying to turn it on. I figured I'd turn off the TV, then use a light on my phone to see my way out. Since I saw no evidence of any booby traps that my grandpa might have laid for me, I headed towards the television diligently watching my step as I did so. The cabinet doors were wide open, which was weird in and of itself, as my grandfather always kept them shut. I was supposed to shut them too, after turning the TV off, but I couldn't help but take a moment to examine it while I had the chance. It looked like a classic 1950s television set, with a wooden box frame, bulging glass screen, and knobs for control but right below the screen, in shiny brass letters, were the words, Inglorious Retrovision. This was confusing to me, since it implied that it was a recreation. I saw that there was a framed letter hanging on the inside of the cabinet door, and while it was hard to read in the dim and inconsistent light, I was able to make out that it was a letter of certification. It stated that the television in question was a genuine, inglorious retrovision, made by an individual called Vladia Dragovich, followed by some nonsense about it using special crystals for transceiving waves in the panpsychic ether. So, that's what made it special then? It was a joke? Some sort of uncharacteristic meta-commentary on the room itself by my grandfather? I shook my head in confusion and reached down to turn the television off. I jolted my hand back when I saw a face in the static staring back at me. Hey there, Ducky, the face grinned. It looked like a young woman's face, her dark hair worn in girlish bunches, her smile equal parts sweet and sinister. I shrieked at the sight of her, stepping backwards and slamming the cabinet door shut as I did so. I was left in almost complete darkness at that point, the only light being whatever flickering static managed to seep through the cracks in the cabinet door. Now that wasn't very nice, the girl chastised me, pouting a little as she did so. I just wanted to say hi. Is this your first time using an inglorious retrovision? I've never seen anyone here before. You, you, you can see me th through, through the television? I stammered. I hadn't noticed any sort of camera built in 
or connected to the television set. Of course, Ducky. It's like a telescreen from 1984, the girl replied. My name's Mary, by the way. Mary Darling. What's yours? Uh, Chris, I answered, hoping that that would be sufficient. Hello, Chris. A pleasure to meet you, she said sweetly. Would you mind opening the cabinet door so that I can see you? My brother's out and I am so bored. I just want to talk to somebody. I froze, unsure of what I should do. My grandfather's list made it very clear that I should shut the television off immediately. But this girl, if that's even what she was, had taken notice of me and I was getting an extremely strong vibe that she was not someone that I wanted to offend. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. No problem. Sorry I slammed them shut on you like that. You startled me is all. I said unconvincingly as I slowly pulled open the cabinet doors to reveal her smirking, staticky face. Yeah, I tend to startle people a lot, she said, playfully twirling her right pigtail. This is Chuck's retrovision, right? How do you know him? Ah, uh, he's my grandpa, actually, I blurted, immediately regretting it. You're friends with him, I take it? No, not exactly. He usually tunes out the instant he sees I've tuned in, she admitted. But I manage to catch him off guard every now and then, though. I swallowed nervously, wondering what it was about this strange girl that had made my grandfather so diligently avoid her. I glanced out at the television set, looking for the power button. I wouldn't do that, Ducky, she said. Except this time, her voice came from behind me and was free of any static distortion. I spun around and saw her sitting on the couch, lit by the glow from the accursed television. Her hair was pitch black, her eyes baby blue, and her silk bathrobe, lipstick and nail polish were all bright red. She held a cherry garnished martini in one hand, a cigarette in the other, and tucked into the sash of her robe were several gleaming kitchen knives, which became orders of magnitude more frightening just through association with her. I couldn't process how she had gotten there. It seemed impossible, but since she wasn't acting hostile at the moment, I was more dumbfounded than terrified. Though I was still plenty terrified, <laughs> How did you how did you get here? I stammered. Mm, I'm not. This is just a projection. You're perfectly safe, Ducky, she said as she took a sip of her martini. No, I never leave my playroom without my brother James. A woman's place is in the home, especially when that home is an extra dimensional pocket of space time that she can bend to her every whim. James goes out on his own when we need new playthings or other supplies and he enjoys the challenges that working within this reality poses. Me, though, I prefer being perpetually drunk on the sense of godlike, nigh-omnipotence I get from ruling our playroom. I get bored when he's out, though, like I said, so I play around with the retrovision and see who's watching. And come, sit beside me, and I'll show you how this thing works. I couldn't smell her cigarette at all, which seemed to corroborate her claim that she wasn't really there. That meant that I was safe for the moment, it seemed, it also meant that I could run away, but that seemed likely to upset her and might end up biting me in the ass down the line. Humoring her seemed like the least risky thing to do, so I politely sat beside her. Ah, uh, you said that you just being a projection meant I was safe. Why wouldn't I be safe if you were really here? You don't look that dangerous. Well, that's kind of the point. If I was a grotesque monster instead of a pretty girl, you'd probably done the smart thing and run out of here as fast as you could. She grinned at me. But since you asked, I'm actually a cannibalistic serial killer, as cliche as that sounds. I chuckled as affably as I could, only for her to take a drag from her cigarette as she glared at me in disdain. I'm not joking, she said coldly. Between us, my brother and I have killed at least dozens of people every year, and I haven't gone a day without eating human flesh since I was a kid. I've always got bits of someone else in my intestines, since I use it in all my cooking. When I was young, 
I even served it to my parents. I told them I got the meat from my home economics class, and when I killed my parents, I served some of them to my home economics class and told them I got the meat from home. And it's not just fun, it's healthy too. A human body has everything the human body needs. You just have to avoid the brain because of the prions. And my cannibalism is purely culinary, by the way. I have no respect for survival cannibalism. I don't abandon my principles when things get rough. Oh, I'm sorry. I can see you're sick of me shoving my lifestyle down your throat. It's a shame I'm not really here, because then I could literally shove my cooking down your throat. Oh, well, let's see what's on TV. She set down her martini and pulled out an old-fashioned remote from her robe. Ah, uh, my, my grandpa said not to change the channel. I protested weakly, knowing it would be useless. Oh, he left you some rules for this, did he? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm not big on rules. With a click of a button, the static-filled screen changed into a monochromatic scene of what looked like an occult office or study. There were gothic bookshelves, a big and ornate desk with a leather chair, and a multitude of antique chests stacked around the room. Be very quiet, she whispered to me with a mischievous smile. Since I'm using your retrovision, he won't know it's me right away. The hell I won't, darling. You think I can't recognize that eldritch aura of yours on a different frequency? A cantankerous old man shot her from somewhere off screen. Stay off of my side waves, or so help me. I will personally see to it that you end up crammed into the same floating box as your Uncle Larry. A dark form briefly moved in front of the screen before it went back to static. Hmm, all right, I guess that's not going to work, she said, disappointed but not upset. That's okay, though. There are things besides other retrovisions putting out strong enough signals that this thing can pick up. She started flipping through the channels rapidly, most of them containing nothing but more static. A few of them contained semi-coherent images and half-audible sounds, but she never stayed on those long enough for me to get a good grasp of what they actually were. It wasn't until she found her first clear image that something seemed to grab her attention. There on the screen was a hooded, hunchback figure perched atop some stone ruins like a gargoyle, leaning on a strange shepherd's crook. Its head looked vaguely like the skull of an elephant or a mammoth, with a singular, cyclopean orifice in the front. The orifice held a small, glowing light deep within its abyssal darkness, but I couldn't tell if it was supposed to be a mouth, an airway, a sensory organ, or all three. Beneath the orifice was a pair of long, tentacle-like appendages that fell to nearly the creature's waist. Pairs of spiracles and wispy tendrils ran all along their tapering length until they each ended in a sharp, hot talon. The creature's fingers, clawed and twice as long as they would be on a human, numbered exactly seven, four on the right hand and three on the left the slender extra digit appearing to be a specialized and possibly vestigial appendage. Its feet were digitigrade, almost velociraptor-like, and it seemed like there was at least one more tentacle, or possibly a tail, hiding under its robes. But other than that, it was humanoid. And despite that, something about it was deeply unsettling, deeply aberrant, deeply wrong. Finally, something good! And Mary squeed in delight. Is that thing real? I asked her, still unsure of how the retrovision was supposed to work. Well, he's not from this reality, so arguably no. She smiled. He's a wanderer, a planeswalker. He's from another level of existence altogether. I can tell from his aura. You mean it's an alien? I asked skeptically. An extra-dimensional alien, yes, but I've never seen his kind before. You don't believe me, do you? Well, I mean, what makes you think it's not just a guy in a suit, or an animatronic, or CGI? I asked. It wouldn't exactly look out of place in the set of a sci-fi movie. I told you, I can tell from his aura that he's not from this plane. But, if for some reason the word of a cannibalistic serial killer isn't good enough for you, why don't you go in for a closer look? These screens have surprisingly good resolution. Her tone made it clear 
that her suggestion was actually in order. So I obediently got up and cautiously approached the television. Up close, I could see that the creature wore a leather van brace on his left arm, with three glowing, hemispherical dials on it, along with various other clockwork accoutrements. A belt around its waist bore a similar design, and its robes had been spun from a strange sort of silk with angular fractals embroidered into them. Such fine, if odd garments upon so monstrous a creature were part of what made it so unsettling. It's inhuman. No, unearthly. Anatomy marked it as something utterly alien. But it had clad itself in what I could recognize as the trappings of both civilization and erudition. It stood oddly still, silently peering out into the night around it, like an ambushed predator waiting in silence for prey to walk by. I couldn't see much other than the creature itself, but from what I could tell, it was alone, and no one else had noticed it yet. I studied its skin closely, trying to discern if it was a silicone or a digital illusion, but as far as I could tell, it looked like living cephalopod skin to me. I peered in closer and closer, bringing my face so close to the screen that I could feel its strong static field on my nose. That's when the creature jolted its head towards me, the glowing dot in its orifice darting around like the lure of an anglerfish. I pulled back from the screen so quickly that I toppled backwards, landing halfway on the couch, where Mary was laughing hysterically. Oh my god, did, 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 did it see me? I screamed. Before she could answer, there was a tapping at the window. We both turned to see the creature standing outside, drumming at the glass with one of its clawed tentacles. I bolted for the door, but when I threw it open, the creature had translocated again and was blocking my path. This time with both its mouth tentacles arched upwards like two cobras poised to strike. Even with its hunched posture, it was just barely shorter than the doorframe, and I had no chance of muscling past it. My only way to escape was breaking through the window. But what good would that do against a creature that could teleport? I didn't dare to fight it, so instead, I just fell flat on my ass and begged for my life. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't looking for you. I, I, I don't even know what you are. I wouldn't know how to find you again if I had to. She was the one who did it. If you're worried about being found again, take her, please. I, 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 I'm no threat to you. I love it when they beg, and Mary chortled as she ate the cherry from her martini. Almost as much as I love a good snuff film, strangle him with those snake arms of yours and gut him like a fish. At that moment, I had no reason to believe that the creature could understand either of us. It looked down at me, and then up at Mary, and then over to the old television set. It tapped a claw on the device of its wrist, and the channel changed to show Mary sitting in her living room, her gleefully sadistic expression instantly turning to one of dismay. Ah, uh, oh, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. She cursed as she fumbled with the remote, and the projection of her vanished immediately, but she seemed to be having some trouble turning her own retrovision off. The strange creature looked down at me one last time, its orifice and tentacles somehow forming an expression that I read as a kindly smile. It's outrageous what they allow on TV these days. It remarked in an echoey deadpan voice, which may have just been in my head. The creature teleported again, this time reappearing on the television with Mary. She shouted and pulled out her knives, but the creature dodged her blows and grabbed her arms and its tentacles. The walls of the room they were in began to melt. And then, I turned off the TV. It was pitch black in the room, but in the screen's dull afterglow, I could just make out my reflection. Deciding I should follow at least one of my grandpa's rules, I slammed the cabinet door shut before the image could register in my brain and I got the hell out of there. I don't know what happened between Mary and that creature, and so long as I never see any of them again, I don't care. I called my grandfather and told him what happened and that I couldn't stay in that house anymore. 
Fortunately, he was understanding, but not exactly forthcoming on anything he knew about what I had been through. When he got out of the hospital, the first thing he did was check on his display room. Nothing was broken or missing or even out of place. With one exception, a kitchen knife was embedded into the couch, exactly where I had been sitting. It looked like it had been thrown straight from the television, or, as impossible as it sounds, threw it. Mary had tried to kill me at some point, it seems, even from the other side of the screen. She had missed her shot, and I, mesmerized by what I saw on the TV screen, failed to notice. Small wonder, then, that my grandfather always keeps the TV cabinet doors closed. As much as James loved the hunt, the prep work that needed to be done beforehand was always a bit tedious. He had to find a door that was relatively secluded and could be easily secured, not within sight of any security cameras, and preferably no cameras in the immediate facility either. But it couldn't be too secluded, as desirable prey needed to be within walking distance for him to lure them in. If he and his sister were desperate, the homeless and drug addicted would do. Putting them out of their misery was easy, but rarely challenging or satisfying. Prostitutes were a little better, but still too easy and fairly cliché. Hardened criminals who fancied themselves intimidating were a regular staple. It was always hilarious to see them reduced to pathetic, weeping husks of their former selves, begging for their lives. Still, if one squinted hard enough, this could possibly be considered vigilante justice, making James and his sister dark and edgy anti-heroes, and that was no good at all. They wanted to be the bad guys, no caveats or asterisks about it. As such, their favorite prey were those who quite unambiguously neither wanted nor deserved to die. Decent, upstanding citizens who expected to live to a ripe old age, only to have the rug cruelly pulled out from under them. Often naive enough that they could be lured into the playroom under the most rudimentary of pretenses. That was much more preferable than having to bring them in by force and risk them making a commotion that could draw attention. As powerful as James and his sister were, hunting was still not completely without risk, hence the need to continually rotate and change hunting grounds. As a man of the house, the risk and responsibility of finding, prepping, and securing hunting grounds fell upon him. James had done a lot of things that he had no problem living with, but one thing he knew he could never live with would be letting his sister down. And speak of the devil. Just as he was thinking about her, his phone started to ring. He reached into his coat pocket and pulled out a rather unusual curiosity, an analog, rotary mobile phone. A relic from the long ago nostalgic never was of yore that they had acquired from Orville's old-fashioned oddity outlet. As much as they loved their 1950s era's aesthetics, the darlings did have to make the occasional compromise for pragmatism's sake. Oh, Mary darling, what a coincidence. I was just thinking about you. He answered cheerfully. <laughs> uh, that's hardly a coincidence, James darling. I expect you to always be thinking about me. Mary replied, trying to be playful, though it sounded like she was short of breath, and, if such a thing were possible for her, unsettled. Is everything all right? James asked, suddenly concerned. You sound a bit out of sorts. Uh, well, actually, there is something a bit out of sorts, yes. She admitted, the panic starting to rise in her voice. Something got into the playroom. What do you mean, something? A planeswalker of some kind. I don't know where he's from or what he is. I just found him on the retrovision. When I saw him, he saw me, and he teleported into the playroom. I threw him into the labyrinth, but I can't monitor him, because the instant I know where he is, he knows where I am. It's some kind of observer effect. 
He seems adept at navigating non-Euclidean spaces, though, so it's only a matter of time before he finds me. I... I don't know if I can handle him on my own. Uh, please, James, darling, come home now. I need you. Sit tight, I'm on my way, he said hurriedly, clicking the phone closed and running off to find an unwatched door. As soon as he had one, he pulled out a bronze control box from his bag and placed it over the door handle. He booted it up as rapidly as he could, hastily inputting a few basic commands. With an ominous whir, the device creaked the door open for him slowly and theatrically, revealing the hollowed-out macabre lobby of their playroom. It had reverted to its original appearance, a high-vaulted chamber made of dark green stone, chill and damp with black mold growing between the cracks in the bricks. Tall, portentous doorways were carved into the stone, each of them leading into narrow, darkened hallways. The only source of light other than what was leaking in from baseline reality, was a cast iron lamp hanging from the ceiling. Mary darling, I'm home, James called out. Normally, if she wasn't already there to greet him with an old-fashioned cocktail, announcing his return was all it took. And today, though, James was greeted with almost complete silence, aside from a constant dripping and a billowing draft. This was concerning, as the playroom should have automatically transmitted his statement to wherever Mary was. Either it wasn't working, or Mary wasn't in a position to respond. And none of this was making any sense. The Darling Twins were eldritch demigods, ageless with superhuman might, and within their playroom, they were full gods with complete control over physical reality. What could Mary have possibly let in that she couldn't handle? Oh, it's just a game. Mary likes playing the housewife. She wants me to kill a spider for her so that she feels protected and cared for, James muttered to himself as he took the control box off the door and slammed it shut. James could have summoned or conjured any weapon that he could imagine, but he started with his old standby, a hickory baseball bat splattered in dried blood, whereas his sister favored knives... James just loved the satisfying splat that one could only get by bashing someone's skull in with a baseball bat. The sound of bones crunching, blood splattering, and blame squelching was beautiful to him. He could take someone out in one swing if he wanted to. He often didn't, though, hitting them just hard enough to cause concussions and brain hemorrhaging so as to give him the opportunity to deliver a more drawn-out and agonizing death. The bat had sentimental value to him as well. It had been a childhood birthday present, and when he made his first kill with it, he chose to hide it in the playroom and say that he had lost it rather than clean the blood off of it. It had been accumulating blood ever since. James considered accessing the surveillance system to locate his sister, but knew that he was likely to spot their intruder as well. If what Mary said was true, that would draw whatever it was right to him. As enraged as he was at something that dared trespass into their home and harass his beloved sister, the rational part of his mind reminded him that he needed more information on the threat before risking a confrontation. And so, he set out to search the labyrinth without any idea of where he was headed. The labyrinth was an ever-shifting, infinitely repeating fractal arranged in higher dimensional space-time, meaning its layout appeared impossible to a three-dimensional being. It was common for the darlings to throw their playthings in there and let them wander around until they went mad. The darlings, though, were both familiar with its properties and capable of visualizing higher dimensional spaces with ease, and James knew his sister... They had played hide-and-seek in their labyrinth as children, and he knew the kinds of places she would hide. He also knew that she chain-smoked when she was stressed, and constantly sniffed with the smell of burning tobacco. He hadn't even run a mile through the protein and frantically branching corridors before his nose was greeted by the scent of his sister's cigarettes wafting out of an armory. He poked his head in to see Mary sitting with her back up against the wall facing the door. Hundreds of knives were laid out around her, 
and she held a particularly gruesome meat cleaver in her right hand. Her left hand held the burning cigarette, and at least half a dozen butts littered the floor around her. She almost threw the cleaver on reflex, but stopped when she saw that it was her brother. James! She cried, running into his arms and hugging him tightly as she began to weep. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to let him in, but and now I, I can't get rid of it. it. It keeps teleporting and it won't stay still long enough for me to kill it. Mary, darling, Mary, calm down. It's okay, I'm here. Just tell me what we're dealing with, James said. Mary opened her mouth to speak, but froze at the sound of clawed footsteps clicking against the stone outside. Both of them spun towards the door and saw the strange creature had stepped into view. It was a hunchbacked and cloaked humanoid, leaning upon an angular shepherd's crook. It was bluish-gray and squid-like, a single cyclopean orifice in his face, with a pair of clawed and perforated tentacles hanging down almost to its midpoint. It was nearly seven feet tall as well, and looked like it could take more than a few swings with a baseball bat before going down. Before James could react, Mary telekinetically threw all the knives she had laid out towards it at supersonic speed. At precisely the right instant, it teleported forward a couple of feet, causing the volley to miss it entirely, and clatter impotently against the stone behind it. Oh, she's been like this since I got in, the creature sighed in annoyance, its voice echoing and ethereal, emanating from no obvious source. Since you two appear to enjoy traditional gender roles, would I be correct in assuming that you are perhaps more capable of acting less hysterically? James held his bat at the ready, but if this thing wasn't going to straight out attack him, he was willing to humor him with conversation. Sir, if you are indeed a sir, you are trespassing in our home, he said firmly. My sister was only defending herself and our property from an intruder. If you do not mean us any harm, then I strongly urge you to explain yourself at once. The creature raised his clawed tentacles in what appeared to be a hostile, or at least offensive gesture, but made no move to attack. Oh, if I had to describe myself in human words, I would call myself a Parazonaut, a traveler of strange alien planes. He answered. I scout the countless planes of creation, searching for anything that may be of interest to my people. Your sister here, or rather, her intended victim, happened to glimpse me on some sort of scrying glass, and it caught my attention. I went to investigate, and when I arrived... I saw your sister watching me from this. This magnificent void between worlds you call home. Surely you can't blame me for wanting to take a closer look. I took no action against your sister, other than what was needed for my own well-being. She's unsettlingly violent, you must admit. It runs in the family, James sneered beating his baseball bat into his open palm. The creature likewise held his crook at a defensive angle, but made no directly aggressive move. You mentioned your people. There are more things like you out there? Of course. I didn't just spring out of the quantum foam from a once-in-an-eternity chance fluctuation, now did I? He asked rhetorically. Which is why... Even if you could manage to slay me, which I doubt you could, it would be a very bad idea. My people possess powers that transcend the laws of our native reality, or any reality we find ourselves in. We killed and ate our own god to get them, and the murder of one of our own is not something that would go unnoticed or unavenged. You don't want to make an enemy of us. The creature's clawed toes dug into the stone floor as he clenched his feet, sending cracks racing out in all directions. A ring of mist began to swirl around his cyclopean orifice, 
the light within shimmering in preparation for some kind of psychic assault, and semi-corporeal tentacles slowly began to unfurl from his back. The darling twins exchanged glances with one another. It was obvious to both of them that the violence they so adored wasn't going to work here. The thing in front of them was strong enough to overpower them, fast enough to evade their attacks, and seemingly not even fully corporeal at all. Mary mouthed the words, Noodle, to her brother, who nodded in agreement. He gently set down his back, and she stuck her meat cleaver into the sash of her housecoat, as even when she was trying to be civil, she couldn't bear to be without a knife altogether. Very well, you made your point. There's no need for threats, James insisted. Let's start over, shall we? I'm James Darling, and this is my sister Mary, and we're delighted to have you as our guest. What would you prefer that we call you? Oh, I'm afraid my name doesn't anglicize or latinize very well, he replied, relaxing his defensive posture. But Kixoto is the closest I can manage. Kixoto it is, sir. Delighted to make your acquaintance. Do I shake your hand or tentacle? Jane smiled. My hand, if you please, James. You haven't earned a tentacle shake yet. Kiksoto replied, extending his right hand. However you please, Mr. Kiksoto, James said as he shook his hand. Mary, darling, why don't you put on some music and mix some drinks while I show our guests around? Of course, James, darling, Mary smiled. She sat backwards, the walls opening into a doorway to let her through, and closing again before Kiksoto had a chance to object. A tessellating wave moved through the room and out into the hallway, transforming the dark stone dungeon into a warmly lit paneling and red carpets. Thank you, Mary Darling, that's so much better, James shouted. Frank Sinatra began playing over an unseen intercom system, and James placed his arm around Kixoto's shoulders. Come, the walk back to the lobby will be so much more pleasant now. Can I offer you a cigar, or perhaps a cigarette? You breathe through those holes on your tentacles, I presume? Correct. And I'll pass on both, he replied, allowing James to lead him out into the hallway. This is some very impressive programmable matter you've got in here, James. Nonsense. It's perfectly pedestrian programmable matter, and Mary just works wonders with it, James insisted, paying close attention to whether the exit signs were green or red, and where their arrows were pointing. So... What is it about our home that caught your interest so much that you simply had to drop in? Voids between worlds that are both stable and habitable are extremely rare. And you've already gone to the trouble of developing it quite substantially, he replied. I still need to complete a full evaluation, of course but I'm quite certain that my people will be interested in acquiring this place. I see, James said softly, his eyes glancing out towards the hidden cameras. And if we have no interest in selling, then things get unpleasant for you, both of you, Kiksoto replied, his tentacles turning upwards in a kind of smirk. As I've already made clear... It's in your best interest to cooperate with us. You will be compensated, substantially compensated, if you do. And what do interdimensional squid wizards use for money, if I may ask? James smirked back. The crystallized ichor of our dead god, he answered, holding out a small purse filled with drops of what resembled a bluish-green amber. Each was aglow with a misty aura and beating with a faint pulse. A small, sigil-marked pupa, slowly rotating within its translucent volume. James paused mid-stride, taken aback by the sight of the strange gems. He began to reach out for one before stopping himself, only for Kiksoto to push the bag towards him insistently. James tentatively picked up a drop and held it out to the light 
rolling it in between his fingers as he allowed its psionic emanations to wash over him. You really killed a god for these, or at least bled one, he said in awe. That's why we use them for currency, so that people know what we're capable of, Kiksoto boasted. Take the whole bag. I'll give you and your sister some time to work out what these are worth to you. Then, then we can negotiate on how many you'll need to sell this place. Right, James said slowly, remembering what it was the stranger visitor had wanted. He pocketed the small purse and continued leading him through the labyrinth. We should be getting pretty close to the lobby by now, and just a few more. Oh, actually, here's something that might be of interest to you. James stopped them right in front of the large glass wall of an enormous aquarium. Bet you can't guess what we have in here, James asked jokingly. He checked the exit sign nearest them, and while its arrow was pointing towards the aquarium, its light was red. A sea monster? Kiksoto asked flatly. That's right, can't get one past you, James laughed, double-checking that they were within view of the cameras. We named her Pool Noodle. She was Mary's idea. I was worried that a three-ton sea monster would basically be a white elephant in terms of upkeep, but it turns out that abyssal sea creatures have remarkably low metabolisms. Just a single human body is enough to sustain this girl for months. Although... I suppose anybody would do. The exit sign changed from red to green, and James gave Kiksoto a superhumanly strong shove through the glass. He passed through it like it wasn't there at all. Almost immediately, he slammed back into it as he tried to teleport back out, but the exit sign had already been switched back to red. Can you hear me in there, squid wizard? James shouted mockingly banging on the glass with him. I told you that Mary works wonders with the programmable matter. She can even make a teleportation proof. She's never bothered to do that to the whole place before, but now that we have to worry about solicitors, I imagine she'll be changing that policy. Kiksoto frantically tapped and turned his glowing dials, slamming into the glass again and again with every teleportation attempt. A flurry of agitated air bubbles and garbled vocalizations erupted from his tentacles as he furiously clawed and pounded at the glass. This came to an abrupt stop, however, as the sound of a deep and eerily whale-like call came rumbling forth from the depths of the aquarium. James smiled widely, and Mary came out from across the hallway with an equally manic grin plastered onto her face. I didn't miss it? She asked handing her brother an old-fashioned cocktail. You're just in time, Mary darling, James said, accepting the drink with an appreciative nod. A spinning ring of glowing sigils and spell circles manifested around Kiksoto's waist as he attempted to either escape or at least curse the darlings with his dying breath. Before he could finish the ritual, however, a creature that vaguely resembled a colossal viper fish or dragonfish and came roaring up from below. Its massive maw clamped down on his body, impaling it with innumerable foot-long fangs and shaking it back and forth like a great white shark, staining the water a fluorescent blue with his blood. The darlings laughed in delight at the spectacle of their pet sea monster and tearing their enemy to shreds and then ravenously gobbling them down. Though such a strange entity in the equally unusual artifacts he had with him surely would have brought in a fortune. The darlings were happy to see them in the belly of their beast, if it meant they got to live to kill another day. So, Mary said once the feeding frenzy was over, pausing to take a sip from her sweet martini. He was a realtor? Nostalgia is a hell of a thing. When I was a teenager, I ran away from home because I was terrified that if my parents ever knew that I liked other girls, it would mean an ice pick lobotomy at the nearest asylum. But 
And despite enduring the very real risk of losing a good-sized chunk of my brain, I still have sepia-toned memories of growing up in a 1950s traditional household with a white picket fence in a conservative small town. Of course, my own experience wasn't the only horror hidden behind the cheery conformist facade. A recent walk down memory lane has reminded me that there were worse and stranger things than homophobia going on in my sleepy little hometown. I'm from a place called Periwinkle Pines, named for its many majestic pine trees and dazzling abundance of periwinkle flowers. Its population was under 4,000 back then, nearly half of which were kids. Most families had three or four kids minimum. As an only child, I already stood out. I never knew exactly why I was an only child, though. I did ask at least once if I could have a sister or brother, and my mother told me that I was already a miracle, and that it would be greedy to ask God for another. When I got older, I logically assumed that meant that she and Dad had difficulty conceiving, and just got lucky with me. But in a religious, and dare I say superstitious small town, where there's not much else to do besides gossip, plenty of people had their own ideas about how my parents had accomplished their miracle. It didn't help that I seemed to have a touch of fairy glamour to me. I was always a little tall, but never lanky or so tall to seem abnormal. I was smart and funny, and kind and charismatic, and a little more assertive than girls were expected to be in those days. Somehow... I always got away with it, though. I was also beautiful, with raven hair and violet eyes. The only violet eyes anyone in town had ever seen. When I hit puberty, I quickly developed what my mother demurely referred to as a matronly figure, though these days my millennial girlfriend enthusiastically describes me as thick with great big anime titties. I consider either of those equally acceptable. Of course, the clincher in the me being a literal miracle theory was that I actually had supernatural powers. Not big ones, though. Not at first. It was mostly mild telekinesis, able to move small items like cards just by thinking, but I could also make unlikely things happen if I tried, or slightly change the properties of objects if only for a short while. My parents didn't know about any of this either, of course. When I realized I was literally magic, I was fortunately old enough to realize it was something I had to keep secret. I'd either be burned at the stake by the townsfolk, or hauled off to be studied at some black ops site. It was definitely scary to be gifted like that, but I'll admit that it also made me feel kind of special. But how did I keep such a monumental secret, you ask? Why, and by taking up stage magic for a hobby and calling myself the Miraculous Miss Mason. It was a hiding in plain sight sort of strategy. It had the benefit of allowing me to not completely hide my gifts from the world, while also providing plausible deniability for any slip-ups. Maybe it was reckless, but I loved attention and for years, no one seemed to seriously suspect I was doing real magic. At least, almost no one. One day, just after school, I tried sneaking under the football bleachers in the hopes of watching cheerleading practice, which I admit was a creepy thing to do, and I shouldn't have done it. When I got there, though, I found that the Darling Twins, James and Mary, had gotten there first to smoke. I wasn't super close with the darlings, but we were on reasonably good terms. Like me, they were the result of a rare single pregnancy and had no siblings aside from each other. They even had the same raven black hair as me, but their eyes were a brilliant baby blue. They had also, inadvertently, helped to confirm that I was only interested in girls. I thought Mary was cute, but not James even though their gender was pretty much their sole distinguishing feature. 
Oh, hiya, Veronica. Mary waved at me. What are you doing back here? Hey, Mary. Hey, James. Is it cool if I join you? I asked as I pulled out my pack of satin stag cigarettes. I always had a pack on me in those days, and I had planned to smoke anyway, so that I'd have an explanation for why I was going there in the first place if I got caught. No, of course not. But I thought you didn't need to sneak smoke since your parents were okay with you smoking at home, she said as her brother offered me a light. They don't mind, but I promised my mom I'd try not to let anyone see me smoke in public. She doesn't want to get hassled over it, I explained, completely truthfully. Wow, you're so lucky your folks are so cool. I wish we had that kind of relationship with our mom, Mary said enviously, taking a furtive glance around to see if anyone else was in earshot. She acts like a sweet little housewife, but whenever James and I misbehave, she sicks our dad on us like a bulldog. And she acts like because she's not the one hitting us, her hands are clean. Honestly, I'm not even sure which one of them I'm more afraid of. Mary, darling, it's not nice to speak ill of our parents in polite company. James chastised her gently, nervously looking me over to assess my reaction. Who says I'm polite? I shrugged, blowing my smoke in his face. Mary, if you want to vent about your folks, go right ahead. I won't tell anyone promise. Thanks, but James gets it worse than I do. He won't admit it, but he does. I know this is kind of an awful thing to say, but James is the only other person I really care about. I just hate it when daddy hurts him, and I think mommy knows that, and, and sometimes hurts him just to punish me, and I... I really hate her for that. Her voice became quiet yet bitter with that last sentence, and I got a glimpse of something very dark percolating inside of her. James saw my expression shift from concern to fear and immediately went on to damage control. I'm terribly sorry, Veronica. You shouldn't have had to hear that. Mary's really a very sweet girl. She, really, she is. But she does have a bit of a vindictive streak that she can't always keep under control, James explained. Yeah, uh, Mommy doesn't know about my vindictive streak yet, Mary smiled. Wow, I had no idea your parents were like that. I said sympathetically, debating on how much of my own situation I should share with them. My relationship with my parents is a little more complicated. They're nice, they really are, and they love me, but... They want me to start looking for a boyfriend, get married as soon as I'm out of high school, and start popping out grandkids. But I, I want to be a performer... I'm planning on moving to Sombramori after graduation and finding some work on Wonderstruck Boulevard. I figure after a few years of that, I might be ready for Broadway or Hollywood. My parents still know that, and I'm worried that if, or I guess when they find out, I'm afraid they might take drastic measures to make sure I have the life they think is best for me. So, in a way... In a different way. I know what it's like to be afraid of your parents. It sucks. It really fucking sucks. Pardon my French. As I puffed my cigarette, Mary and James exchanged glances with each other, seemingly to speak in the near telepathy of intense familiarity that a lot of twins seem to have, reaching some sort of understanding. I think you'd be a wonderful performer, Veronica. You're so pretty, and that magic act you did for the school talent show was amazing. No one was surprised when you got first place. As a matter of fact, I do recall hearing some people say that if they didn't know any better, they'd have thought you were doing actual magic, James remarked, with a provocative raising of his eyebrows. That's a rather curious thing to say, don't you think, Mary Darling? Not at all, James Darling. Everyone knows there have been witches in Harrowick County since Sombramori was founded nearly 200 years ago, Mary replied, though she was looking at me when she said it. It was obvious that their conversation was just for my sake. Lots of people think that some of that old magic's come down to us over the years. It's not too much of a stretch from that to think that a beautiful raven-haired, violet-eyed girl who shuns all suitors and makes playing cards dance on her fingertips might have a touch of the uncouth to her. Uncouth? How dare you, I smirked, tossing my head in a haughty laugh. 
She means uncanny. Eldritch. That's the word. James clarified. Something from outside the known world that's alien and existentially disturbing. To most folks, at least. But not you, I asked cautiously. Mary and I have always had an avid interest in the fantastical, James told me. And it's an interest that's paid off, if you can believe it. Paid off? I asked curiously. Yes, like your magic act. Only we've kept the fruits of our labor a little more... discreet? Mary replied. It's not the kind of thing you show off to just anyone. Even our parents don't know. You, though, miraculous Miss Mason, might appreciate it more than anyone else in this sorry little town, James suggested with a coy smile. And it seems that you might know a few things that we would appreciate. If you'd like, Ducky, we could head back to our house and we can show you what we mean. And then maybe... You can teach us how to do a magic trick or two, Mary offered. And you don't need to worry about my brother trying to get fresh with you. I promise I'll be there the whole time. That was a concern, since I didn't really know James well enough to want to be alone with him. But Mary's presence wasn't much reassurance. Everyone knew the darling twins were of the same mind on everything, and stuck together through thick and thin. If anything... It was easier to imagine Mary being an accomplice to any mischief James might have in mind than trying to help me. And despite that, they had piqued my curiosity. If they knew anything about the supernatural, anything at all, I had to know what it was. All right then, I nodded, putting out my cigarette. I suppose it wouldn't hurt if I stopped by your place on the way home. The two of them grinned identical grins in perfect synchronicity with each other, and I immediately began to question my choice. The twins walked me to their house, which was about ten minutes away from the school. Mary stood in between me and James, ostensibly to honor her earlier promise, but I got the feeling that she didn't like her brother being alone with other girls more out of jealousy than any sort of feminine solidarity. The way she had spoken about him earlier and the way she looked at him like he was frickin' Elvis. It just seemed really messed up. Tell me, Ducky, do your friends call you Veronica, or do you go by something a little less fancy? Mary asked, her arms linked with mine like we had been best friends for ages. It was a bit intrusive, honestly, but I've never been one to turn a pretty girl away. Everyone calls me Veronica. It's sophisticated, which suits me, I replied. Besides, it doesn't really shorten that well. Very is an adverb, not a nickname, and Ronnie's a boy name. What about Icky? She suggested. No, that's even worse. It sounds like a clown's name. I laughed. Oh, this is it. Home sweet home, 23 Cherry Street, Mary said, as she brought us to an abrupt stop. It was a typical mid-century suburban home, one story and under a thousand square feet just like mine. It blended in perfectly with the houses around it, and it didn't surprise me that even the Darling twins nearly walked right past it when they weren't paying attention. Father shouldn't be home for a couple of hours at least, but I'll check just to make sure Mother's napping, James announced. Mommy's usually asleep around this time, thanks to her little helpers. She expects me to get dinner started, but she takes all the credit when Daddy gets home. Unless something's wrong, and then that's my fault. Mary whispered bitterly as her brother peeked his head inside the house. At least James appreciates me. If I didn't have him, I think I would have snapped a long time ago. I wasn't sure how to respond to that. I was getting a very strong vibe that her relationship with her brother wasn't entirely healthy. But at the same time, I understood it. Back then, I didn't have anyone I would trust with my darkest secrets or my most intimate desires. But if I had, maybe I would have thought as highly of them as Mary thought of James. James nodded at us from the front door and waved us in. Mary took me by the hand and led me through the front door. We passed through the living room, where I saw their mother lying in a contented stupor on the couch as a soap opera played on the black and white television. My mother's little helpers were amphetamine so she could keep the house spotless and still greet my dad with a martini and a blowjob. Figuratively, 
at least when I was around, when he got home. As much as I hate to admit it, I had internalized that enough that I was a little disgusted to see a woman nabbing in the middle of the afternoon in a less than perfectly kept house. Sorry about the mess. It's our fault, even though we've been at school all day, Mary whispered to me. James shushed her and led us into the back hall into their bedroom. You two share a room? I asked, a little surprised. I knew that I was privileged to have my own room since most houses in town only had two or three bedrooms, with an average of five or six people living in them. But it had always been my understanding that the kids' rooms were segregated by gender. Of course we do, Ducky. We're twins, Mary shrugged. We spent almost nine months squeezed together inside of our mom, so sharing a bedroom is no big deal. Besides, it's more spacious than you might think, James grinned. He opened the closet door, theatrically gesturing to its interior. As you can see, Miss Mason, here we have a perfectly ordinary bedroom closet. I nodded in agreement, politely waiting to see where he was going with this. He shut the door again, this time placing his hand on the wooden panel and closing his eyes in concentration. I skeptically arched an eyebrow, but when I glanced over at Mary, I could see that she was eagerly anticipating the results. When James lowered his hand again, she jumped to the other side of the door, theatrically gesturing as he opened it. Where before there had only been clothes on hangers, now there was a long, damp hallway carved out of dark green stone with a vaulted ceiling, like it belonged to some ancient haunted castle or monastery. Ta-da! Would you look at that? Mary said, grinning from ear to ear. For a moment, all I could do was stare in disbelief. My rational mind told me it had to be an illusion of some kind, but I had no idea how such an illusion would be possible. I could feel the air that was coming out of the hall, and it was markedly different than the air from inside the house. It was colder, staler, more humid, and carried a noticeable scent of rot with it. I very cautiously approached the doorway and stuck my arms through and waved it around, and the hall seemed as real as it looked. What is this? I whispered, my voice tinged with a mixture of terror and wonder. It's our playroom, our secret playroom. Mary explained. Mommy and Daddy don't know about it. Our great Uncle Lawrence made a door to it here and showed us how to open and close it ourselves. You see, our Uncle Larry had a little something extra to him. Something otherworldly. From outside our reality. Something... Eldritch, James said. My mother and sister have it too. As a result, we're not exactly... normal. No, not in the slightest, Mary agreed, still beaming. Would you like to come in? I swallowed nervously. I was curious, sure, but I was really weighing the risks of going inside against the risk of upsetting my very peculiar hosts. That's outside of our reality? I asked meekly. They both nodded proudly. Please, come in. We promise you won't be disappointed, one of them said. I don't remember which. Or, rather, I remember both of them saying it simultaneously, but for some reason, that's the one part I'm sure I'm remembering wrong. They couldn't have actually been that creepy in real life, right? I should have politely declined and made up an excuse to get out of there. Or I should have said hell no, and run away as fast as I could. At the very least, I should have asked them to explain that smell. Instead, I just nodded. I let Mary take me by the hand and pull me in, and James shut the door behind us. From the other side, the door still looked like a closet door, completely out of place at the end of the mystical hallway. Is that the only way out? For now, but I've been tinkering with a device that I'm hoping will let me move the portal to other doors, James replied. I peered down the hall, but I couldn't see very far in the dim light. 
I could see a few lanterns hanging from the ceiling and a few rectangular doorways carved into the walls. But that was it. But the smell of rot was far stronger now. How far does this go on for? I asked. As long as we want it to, Ducky, Mary answered. The space here isn't like space back home. We can make the rooms appear in any order we want, and we can even redecorate this whole place with new things if we focus hard enough. I'm getting really good at it. With enough practice, I think I can even give this place an outside. As soon as James and I don't need our parents anymore, we're going to move in here and play house forever, so I want it to look nice for us. So, what do you think, Veronica? Are you impressed? Is this enough for you to swap trade secrets with us? James asked, hopefully, as he put his arm around his sister. I wasn't sure if impressed was the right word, but they had certainly exceeded my expectations. An infinite, transmutable pocket dimension outside of space and time certainly put my magic tricks to shame. Allying myself with them and sharing in their knowledge of the preternatural was a tempting opportunity, and I think I would have said yes if it wasn't for one little thing. Why does this place smell like death? I asked softly. The twins exchanged glances, and James gave his sister a reticent nod. Yeah, I guess it's better to get that out of the way sooner rather than later. Mary sighed. And this way, Ducky. Just try not to scream, okay? The twins led me into a nearby room, where the stench was the strongest, almost overpowering. The smell was rising out of a pit in the floor, and I knew I was going to be sick with it. My stomach lurched in a mixture of disgust and fear, since I knew there was nothing innocent that could explain such a god-awful stench. I knew there'd be carcasses in there. Nothing else could explain the smell. But I was still desperately hoping that there wouldn't be any human corpses. How could there be human corpses? It was impossible. The darlings were teenagers, no older than me, hardly more than children, and I had known them for years. No matter how bad it looked, no matter how bad it smelled, I refused to consider the obvious explanation until I saw it with my own eyes. Piled up in that pit were dozens of human corpses, the most I had ever seen in one place by a ludicrous margin. All of them were mangled and mutilated, all of them in various states of decomposition, all of them swarming with maggots and flies. Limbs were twisted at odd angles with broken bones jutting out or hacked off entirely. Burns and lacerations were ubiquitous, and at least one person's skin had been flayed off altogether. One body had been eviscerated and stuffed full of God knows what. One had had its skull impaled with a golf club, another had its face sawed off, and it just got more and more gruesome from there. It was so bad that some of the bodies were barely recognizable as human beings anymore. But most were undeniably men, women, teenagers, and even children. My father never told me what he saw when he helped to liberate prisoners from Axis concentration camps at the end of the World War, but I can only assume it was something like what I saw in that pit of atrocities. I didn't scream. I ran out of the room and vomited, but I didn't scream. Screams are for terror, not horror, and I was too horrified at what I'd seen to be terrified for my own life. I looked up at the Darling Twins, who were watching in patient anticipation of my reaction, not one shred of remorse on their faces. People, people have been disappearing over the last few years all over the county, but especially from town. It, 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 it was you? I choked out through tearful sobs. All but one. I really wonder about that guy sometimes. Mary nodded. Why? I demanded. Well, wouldn't you wonder? Did he just run off? Did someone else get him? Did... Why the murders? I screamed. Well, we both fantasize about killing for as long as we can remember. James answered. This place gave us somewhere we could do it safely. And we... We just couldn't resist. Both of you? 
I asked, looking at Mary in dismay. It's like James said, I have a vindictive streak, she grinned. Look, Veronica, we like you, which is why we're being upfront with you about this. Yeah, we lure people in here to be tortured, killed, and then chucked into a pit, because that's how we get our rocks off. We're monsters, and we're fine and dandy with that. But you, miraculous Miss Mason, you're more useful to us alive. So we're willing to let you use this place for whatever you want, in exchange for you putting on a private magic show now and then. That's not such a bad deal, is it? And we'll even seal off the morgue so it doesn't stink up the rest of the place. And I've been meaning to do that anyway, Mary offered. I stared in horror at the smiling twins, their eyes twinkling like dying stars in the abyss. They made no threat about what would happen if I refused their offer, since none needed to be made. Fighting them would be far too dangerous. They outnumbered me, and they were clearly more skilled with violence, and I still didn't know exactly what they were or what they were capable of. I did have a clear shot to the exit, but they could see that as well as I could. They were toying with me. If I ran, I was prey, and I wouldn't get far. So, I decided that maybe I should give them what they wanted. You, you want a private magic show? I sobbed, struggling against the moral and physical revulsion I felt. I forced myself upright and pulled out my deck of trick cards. For my own safety, I had never shown anyone else the full extent of what I could do with those cards, but the darlings had earned themselves an exclusive premiere. I shuffled the deck with a practice flourish, and I saw the twins' faces light up in wonder as each card was illuminated with a magical aura. I tapped my index finger on the back of the deck, and as I raised my hand into the air, the cards rose with it, fluttering around and around on their axis, their faces changing with each rotation. I spun my arm around and around, creating a swirling vortex of playing cards between me and them. Th th think of a card, any card, j just don't tell me what it is. Ha 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 have you... I stammered. Ha ha have, you have you picked one? They both nodded, eager to see what sort of trick I would do. Are these your cards? When I said this, the vortex instantly uncoiled into a long, lashing whip of cards, slashing each twin across the face as it did so. As they screeched in pain, I turned and bolted for the exit, the card whip still trailing behind me and lashing about like crazy, keeping the darlings at a distance. Veronica, get back here! Mary screamed at me. They weren't chasing me, though. Instead, the stone walls around me began to shake and rumble, groaning as they closed in around me, threatening to crush me, or at the very least cut off my escape. The lanterns fell from the ceiling, just barely missing me as I ran past, and out of the corner of my eye, I just barely made out some dark, shapeless form crawling out of one of the foreboding doorways. In spite of all that, I made it. They may have had control over everything within their playroom, but the door to their bedroom was still part of our reality, and I threw it open easily enough. Once I was out, I retracted all my trick cards back into my pocket and ran out of the darling house, waking up Mother Darling as I did so, and not stopping to answer any of her questions. I didn't stop running until I made it back home. I wish I could have told my parents or the police or somebody about what I'd seen in that room, but I knew it was pointless. I couldn't prove anything. If anyone were to investigate, they'd just find an ordinary closet in the Darling Twins' bedroom, and I'd probably end up getting that lobotomy I've been trying so hard to avoid. I wish I could have brought some justice to the Darling's victims. I wish I could have stopped them from killing again. But there was nothing I could do. The Darlings and I just avoided each other for the rest of the school year, and that summer was when I ran away from home. I ended up not going to Sombra Mori after all, instead getting a gig in a circus, which I'm now the ringmaster of. But that's not actually relevant to this story. What matters is that I never went back to Periwinkle Pines, or saw the Darlings again. 
At least, not until a few nights ago. I'm in my 70s now, even though I barely look half of that. I'm the miraculous Miss Mason, after all, and I've only gotten more miraculous as the years have gone by. The reason I had never gone back there is that I had always been conflicted about running away from home and breaking my parents' hearts, and I didn't know how I would react if I ever ran into them. But this time of year always invites reflection, and this year more so than most. So I decided to finally go back. The town hadn't grown or changed all that much, but my old house was gone. I hadn't really expected to find my parents there anyway. If they're still alive, they'd be near a hundred by now. My walk through town did, however, eventually take me to Cherry Street, and it was in a surprisingly sorry state. The road itself was barricaded, with multiple signs warning vehicles and pedestrians alike to stay out. The entire neighborhood looked like they'd have been abandoned and neglected for decades, with the sole exception of the Darling's house. It was in pristine condition, not to mention strung up with Christmas lights, the sole beacon and cheer on that derelict street. As I approached it, the living room light came on, even though no one was inside it. A moment later, I spied a young woman in a Christmas sweater and poodle skirt stepping out of the back hallway and coming towards the window. It was Mary. She looked even younger than I did, around 20 or so. But I had no doubt that it was her, and by the expression on her face, she recognized me too. She turned around and shouted, and I saw James come out in a matching sweater. The two of them stood there together, smiling at me through the window. It was the same creepy grin I remember from all those decades ago. James waved at me, and Mary gestured for me to come in and join them. I ran from them. Their house. That street. And the entire town. Without looking back once. <laughs>